Hey, Campfire crew, let's get it on. A Skidwalker or My Curse by Bropiated. I lived in Rodan, Montana for a short while on a Salish Indian reservation. It was and still is the most beautiful part of the Rockies I've ever seen. I currently live and grew up in Colorado. When I first moved there, I went there to go to the Job Corps to be a diesel mechanic. It was a vocational school. When I got there, it got weird during orientation because two of the main concerns the people expressed were, number one, don't go on the reservation at sunset or afterwards for your own safety, and two, when on the reservation, do not disrespect the land, litter, or leave anything unnatural out there. This kid named Sean was also from Colorado, and he was on the same flight I was. We became really good friends. We began to notice the natives didn't go out in the dark, and they would always stick to wherever the light was. My first full night there, I was a newbie and had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to prepare breakfast. My first night, I was dead asleep but felt someone shaking me, saying, Wake up, bud. It's time to wake up. I lazily crawled out of my bunk and noticed Sean was still asleep. I put on my flip-flops and peeled down the very long dorm hallway, thinking, Oh, there's someone at the end. Wyatt, our door leader, was meant to wake me up. But I noticed the silhouette didn't move at all. The dorm was oddly dark. I started walking down the hall, and I felt like I was walking in mud. I got to the center room, Wyatt's room. He was dead asleep. His alarm clock read 3.08 a.m. It's still probably 75 feet from me. Then I started to walk back with my eyes glued on it. I got back to my doorway, and I swear to God, I heard sprinting, and I saw something sprinting towards me the second I passed the threshold from my door. The moment I froze, the stomping sound stopped. Suddenly, I flew back across the hall out of nowhere, maybe ten feet. I couldn't even scream. I got up and tried to wake up Sean, but it wasn't happening, so I just clambered back into my bed, shaking. Later, I woke up to Wyatt actually waking me. I was confused. Was it a dream? Come to find out, nobody left their beds after 12. After four months, I noticed that it was haunted as fuck. The reservation and lake trail that started on the other side of the creek. It separated the campus from it. I was sleeping with this Salish native who grew up down the road. We liked to go out there and sit by the lake and watch the otters. But she'd never stay out long enough for the sun to touch the mountains. She would just freak out and we would have to go. One day, Sean was out there with us and we were just smoking cigarettes and skipping rocks. I mean, it was a truly beautiful place. My girl looked to our left and saw a deer unusually close to us, kind of like it hadn't noticed us. She started chanting in Salish tongue and started to panic. Then out of nowhere, she started crying. I mean, bawling. She started screaming, RUN! She bolted off. Me and Sean stood up, confused. But there was something about that deer. It stared at us. Uh, not just at us, but like it was looking at our souls. We both started feeling really uneasy. Tried to scare it off, but it wouldn't move. We then noticed the sun was at the mountains, and we started walking back. The deer followed us, maybe 15 feet behind. Probably less. We started picking up the pace. Then we saw a raven sitting on a fence post not four feet away on the trail. It cawed, and the deer was gone, but we should have seen it take off, right? No. It just vanished. We had a mile left, and we really fucked up. It got weird, and it got foggy, so we couldn't really see more than, I don't know, 20 feet. But then we heard and saw it, and we smelled something like a dead animal. Off to the left of the trail, we heard what sounded like tearing and breaking. Being ballsy white boys in good shape, we made a few steps over to make out a figure with no clothes on the ground. 
and antlers. Josh, that's a deer, Sean whispered. And we just looked at the thing tearing at it. We started walking backwards, eyes locked on this thing. Sean tripped on a rock and quietly said, Ouch! It was too quiet, though. Whatever it was, stopped doing what it was doing as if it was listening for us. Maybe it could hear us breathing, I don't know. The thing stood up. Its legs were really long and skinny. I mean, I'm telling you, it was on two fucking legs. The arms folded down abnormally long. The first thing that came to my mind was the ice cream man from the movie Legion. It didn't have any clothes, and its head turned our way. The jaw and mouth, normal, but it smiled. And I'm not fucking around. It waved at us. Pure terror. And we bolted. I mean, we sprinted and did not stop. It sounded like the world was ending behind us. The cracking, the creeping, the bushes rustling. And we didn't look back. When we got close enough to others, we started screaming for help, and some of the staff rushed out to meet us. We both cried in our instructor's arms for a good half hour, and as we connected with them in our sprint, they too saw a taller, skinny man chasing us. Then they saw it dart off to the left, into the dark and fog. My girl was there too. She knew what we saw. Hell, they all did. Come to find out, If you live on that land, you've seen him. They call him a skinwalker. He appears as something you normally find pleasing, but then twisted into fear to get your flesh. I never went back out there again, but I did sit on the other side of the creek and watch, and I know we were watching each other. An Abandoned Jockey Truck at CB7, submitted by Painkiller. Before I became an over-the-road truck driver, I worked at the state docks on third shift. In case you don't know, I've worked the third shift by myself for about the first six months on the job because nobody obviously wanted to work at night. I can't honestly say that I really blame them. On this particular occasion, I had finally gotten someone to work with me. He had started the week before this happened, and with that out of the way, here's my story. I arrived at work at about 10.45 p.m. as I usually did. There was nothing particularly special about this night other than it was raining. It was about the end of November, and it had started to finally cool off in Georgia, and we were all thankful for that. Even though it had started to cool off, it was still somewhat humid, and if you're at all unfamiliar with our winter season here, The cold has a bite to it because of the humidity. This was a Friday night, and before I left my Thursday night shift on Friday morning at 8 a.m., I was told that for Saturday morning dispatch, we had 49 trucks ordered to work. However, when me and my coworker Ryan came in that Friday night, we learned that the two ships had canceled the dispatch. We were both like, cool, we can just service what comes in later and then just take our time. There were only 28 trucks that needed to be serviced, but being the third shift lead tech, I had a few other things to do with servicing the trucks. No big deal. As per usual, all the trucks came in just after midnight, so we parked them. There were only 27 trucks that came in. Oh, that's strange, I thought to myself. I wonder where it's at. So I went into the dispatch office and got all the truck and trailer numbers that I had dispatched that morning and I was most definitely missing a truck in a trailer. I had to go and find this missing unit because I could be held responsible if something happened to it, or if it was involved in an accident. I walked over to Ryan and told him to go ahead and start servicing the truck, and to make sure he wrote down the hours correctly from the meter inside the trucks. I told them that I had to go and find this truck and trailer, wherever it was, and get it back to the yard. He then asked me, How long before you come back? It was kind of an odd question, but I answered, well, that depends on where the truck is, if it cranks or not, and if I can move it. Why? He told me he wasn't feeling well. I looked at him and asked him, then why did you come to work? He mumbled something, and I just told him to go ahead and go on home. 
Ryan left just before I left the yard, and I had no expectations of seeing him until Saturday night. So I got into a jockey truck that we had welded a boom arm onto that we can pick up a jockey truck and trailer it and pull it back to the yard if it was unable to start or release the brakes or was in some type of catastrophic accident that required my full attention to move it and clean up the area where it happened. Just as I had left the gate of our yard, I got a call from the port police. They asked me if I was missing a truck and trailer, and of course I told them, yeah, yes I am. The officer then told me where I could find it, and then he told me that there was also yet another truck in the same general area. I thought, great, now I'm totally fucked. The hits just keep on coming with this damn job. Not only did I now have to service 28 trucks, I also had a truck that I couldn't find at first look. I also had to get the hours on every single truck at this port, and I also had to drive about 20 minutes to the next port and get the hours on the trucks from that location. I didn't like to put off something till tomorrow that I can do today, so I chose to get them all done in one night. <laughs> this was obviously not going to happen tonight. Anyway, I'm in the tow truck and driving out to the dock to check on this abandoned truck and trailer. The port has a speed limit of 25 miles an hour, but since there's not supposed to be anyone else but me and the port police on the port, I drove that tow truck with my foot buried in the floor. This particular jockey truck, tow truck, was uh, able to do about 47 miles an hour when she was wide open. That doesn't sound like a lot, I know, but it's pretty damn brutal when the jockey truck has 63,000 pound leaf springs in the front and no suspension in the rear, so you could end up pissing blood for a week because it would bruise your kidneys. That particular place this abandoned truck and trailer was, was about 5 miles from our service yard, and as soon as I cleared the container stacks, I could see way off to my left flashing blue and red lights. I turned and headed in that direction. When I finally arrived at the truck about two minutes later, the cop asked me what I knew about the truck. I told him, all I know is I dispatched it in this morning. Didn't come back with the other truck that were working this vessel. I also told him that I had no idea where it was before they called me about it. It was peculiar because the vessel was at CB2, or Container Berth 2, and this truck was obviously a few football fields away from the ship. After that brief exchange with the officer, I got to work checking the truck to determine what was wrong with it and why it was left abandoned on the dock. I tried to work as quickly as possible because, like I stated before, it was raining. I checked all of the fluid levels and saw nothing on the ground. I knew that the truck was safe to try and start, and it started right up. It had obviously been sitting for a few hours by the time I got to it, so I had to wait for the air pressure to build up before I attempted to move it. While I was waiting for that, I began to scan the area for the other truck that I was told was in the same general area. I didn't immediately see that truck, so I kind of put it in the back of my mind. Just as the cab airbag started to level the cab, I spotted someone walking behind a container stack. The port police officer had left about 10 minutes before, so I knew it wasn't him. I knew that all the longshoremen were gone, and so were the stevedores. Nobody else should have been anywhere near where I was. Port police did some rounds at night every couple hours or so, but this truck was reported to the third shift officers by the second shift in a report. I shut off the abandoned truck and jumped back into the tow truck and headed to the container stack where I had seen the person disappear. I was running the truck full tilt as fast as she would go, and by the time I got there, I saw him from my peripheral vision walk in between two containers and another stack. There's about 60 feet that separate the container stacks, and this is the same for all the stacks no matter where they were on this particular spot. So I drove to where I had seen him walk to once again. My tow truck was fitted with spotlights on the back and both sides for when I was working at night, so I turned them on. It's really easy to make your way in between containers without being seen, and whoever was doing this used that to their advantage. It was also easy to hear me coming because the diesel engine of the tow truck was so loud. For the next 20 minutes or so, this guy kept eluding me in my tow truck. It was about then that I noticed it was already a quarter past 3 a.m., and I couldn't stay out there anymore trying to track this guy down. So I went back to the abandoned truck, hooked it up to my tow truck, picked it up off the ground, 
got back in and started it and released the brakes. I still remember that I had another abandoned truck in the same area and drove down to the end of CB7 to see if I could find it. I drove along the chain link fence that separated CB7 for the then under construction CB8. In doing so, I looked to my left and was looking down the container stacks to see if I could find the other missing truck. I didn't know anything about it other than the cop that reported it to me that it was quote unquote in the same general area. <laughs> definitely not a lot of help. As I was driving and looking with my spotlights, I saw the truck. It was totally not in the general area. The container stacks are really dark at night, so I approached it very carefully. I mean, that is very hard to do when I have two diesel engines running at the same time. It's even harder to stay quiet when I have the spitter valves blowing off excess air from the air tanks as well. Just as I got to within about a hundred yards of the missing truck, I noticed that the lights were on because I could see the red lights on top of the headache rack. I didn't know if the truck was running or had run out of fuel, but I was about to find out. I guess I was about 40 yards away when the truck started to move. What the fuck? I said out loud to myself. This is not good. I called the port police immediately and told them that I found the truck, and there is an unauthorized person driving it. They dispatched two cars, and I told them I was following the truck and where I was. This person, whoever he was, had gotten a considerable distance ahead of me since I was way down pulling another truck and trailer behind me. I was going as fast as I could given the circumstances, and just as I was coming to about the last mile to my service yard, here come the two police cruisers in my mirror, probably doing about 60. I reached the last curve before the yard and saw the person in the now stolen truck drive up to the service area and power slide the truck by pulling out the parking brakes, jumping out of the truck, and bolting away towards the fence. Then, before I made it to the gate, the two cruisers screamed past me and stopped at the truck, got out and drew their weapons. The person had run towards a gate that was locked after 4 p.m. The fence was eight feet tall and had barbed wire and razor wire all around the top. And I had finally made it into the service area and shut down the tow truck. Then, three more cruisers came blasting into the yard, and one of the officers told me to stay in the truck in the well-lit area of the service bay. <laughs> I did as I was told. After what felt like eternity, I heard the officers yelling at someone to, Get out on the fucking ground! And a couple of minutes later, they were dragging a man out of the shadows that was covered in dirt and bleeding. They asked me if this was the guy I saw driving the truck, and I told them, I never got a look at his face, but if that is the guy you caught, then I'm pretty sure he's the guy. All I could tell was that he was bald and was wearing a pair of coveralls. They escorted him to one of the cruisers and put him in the back seat. Then one of the officers said, We found this knife on him. Did you see he had it? I told them that I was unsure if he did, in fact, have any weapon on him because I didn't see it. I mean, I'm not really sure what he had in mind carrying that thing around. It was definitely not a pocket knife. It looked more like a hunting knife with a fixed blade to me. The port police asked me if I wanted to press charges, and of course I said yes. I told them to charge him with whatever they could. I'm not sure what that was all about, but apparently it didn't stick because he got out and returned to his job with the longshoreman's hall about a month later and he had the nerve to show up at my window to be assigned to truck and trailer. I refused to dispatch him and had the port police remove him from the property. The longshoreman's pit license was revoked, and then he lost his port credentials. This forced him out of a job. He never returned to my dispatch window the remainder of the time that I worked there. When I came into work that next Saturday night, I told Ryan what had happened the night before. He was always kind of a nervous guy, and I'm glad he wasn't on the yard when this happened. He would have probably gotten hurt pretty bad. He wasn't one of those people who kept calm under pressure or in a situation like that. If he had been there, I'm going to bet that that would have been his last night, but they made me lead tech for a reason. Along with the port police report I had to submit to the office, I had to submit my own report as well. And no, this is absolutely not the last creepy story from my time working third shift at the port. I've got more to come.
The Strange Man, submitted by Anonymous. My name isn't important, and I assure you that I am stable and sane. Let me tell you what happened to me a few years ago. I started a job as a waitress, my first time doing that kind of job. It was an old restaurant opened under new management. And the owner was in his 30s and seemed nice. I showed up for work, and he sat me at a table and told me to relax and just watch him work while he brought me a plate of food. Steak burger with fries, I think. There was no uniform, so I probably looked like a customer. The place wasn't busy, and the layout was an L-shaped dining room. The door was to my right, and there was a wall that ran halfway down the room creating the long side of the L and a bar against the far wall. There wasn't a bartender as it was a Wednesday night, and I watched the owner greet customers while I watched him as he sat them on the other side of the wall and just ate my food. About 9 o'clock, I walked over to him as he sat reading some papers. I placed my hand on his shoulder, and he jumped and spun around with a look of terror on his face. I felt so bad, and wondered if he was one of those people that were afraid of being touched. I apologized profusely for startling him, and asked if there was anything I could do. I felt so bad about doing basically nothing all night long. The owner looked at his watch, told me to just stand there, and man the front door. Then he walked past the bar and into an unmarked door that he had mentioned during the tour was just a storeroom. After a few minutes of waiting, a thin, gray-haired, nondescript man entered the restaurant. I smiled. He was my first customer. Follow me, I said, as I walked to the other side of the dining room that only had four tables with diners. I turned to the left about five feet to offer him a seat at a small table or a lunch counter of sorts that was empty. He was still walking straight, making for the back corner of the dining room, and I thought, I didn't ask if he was meeting anyone. As I took a few steps towards him, he disappeared. I kid you not, he disappeared. There weren't any potted plants to step behind or anything else to shield him from view. He literally disappeared. I made a beeline for the storeroom, trying not to run. I just rushed in and shut the door behind me. The owner was standing in the storeroom, with nothing in his hands, just looking at me. I wasn't certain how to start, but I blurted out, a, a man just disappeared as I was showing him to his table. He stared at me and said nothing at first. Then he cleared his throat. Did he say anything? I stopped and thought for a moment and said, No. He just said, Okay and calmly walked out the door and back to where he was sitting at the bar before. I grabbed my purse and left. Creepy Uber Story, submitted by Nick B. Here's my story. I'm a 28-year-old male, and this happened a year ago, prying to me typing this story out. I first started driving for Uber back in November 2017 after being without a job for several months. The job market where I used to live was terrible. <laughs> I figured beggars couldn't be choosers. Starting out, I thought Uber was cool, making your own hours and money driving around. It does take a toll on you, though, when you drive full-time and hell on your car. As a side note, Uber is a waste of time and not worth the money. I was hanging out at my buddy's cell phone store, shooting the shit with him and waiting for a call to come in. I received a ping going to the local hospital, so I hopped in my car and started making my way there. About a minute into my drive, the customer called and told me that he is at the emergency room. I acknowledged and continued on my way. I pulled up to the ER, and a security guard came up to me and said, Uber? I said, yes. She motioned for my customer to come over, and he was a short, chubby, bald man, probably in his mid-thirties. I'm not really good at telling age these days. The man hopped in my car, and he seemed normal. He was telling me how he was at the ER for anxiety, and the people in there were thinking he was on drugs. I was like, hmm, okay, I get that. I've been in the hospital for anxiety myself. 
As we were making our way out of the parking lot, the man said, Hey, are you on the phone with the cops? I said, No, sir. And a moment later, he was like, Sir, can we go to the McDonald's in Sylvester? First off, I'll go ahead and say that I used to live in the shithole town of Albany, Georgia, for any of you guys that might know of that town. (laughs) Anyway, Sylvester is a town 30 minutes away from Albany. I said, Sir, there's a McDonald's right down the road. And he said, No, I want to go to the one in Sylvester because I am out of their jurisdiction. At this point, I'm like, no wonder these people at the hospital thought he was on drugs. The dude's on drugs, or he's just fucking nuts. Now I'm thinking, fuck. Luckily, his destination was the Hilton in downtown Albany, about three or four minutes from where I picked him up. I started to tell him, hey, let me take you to your hotel first, and then I'll take you to McDonald's. Once again, he asked, are you on the phone with the cops? I replied, no. All right, this guy is delusional, so I'm thinking he probably has no idea what's going on. I start to pull up to the hotel, and I'm like, okay, here we are, sir. And he says, you can pull up to the canopy. I pull up, and he hops out very quickly, and I nope the fuck out of there. I'm like, hotel staff, he's your problem now. Which I do feel kind of bad for them, as I used to work front desk, too. I now work for a utility company far the fuck away from shitty Albany, Georgia. The perfect job for an introvert like me in a cubicle. I just look at plates all day. Crazy bald guy? (laughs) Let's not meet again. Don't Trust Everyone You Meet Submitted by Ernie Ball Fan I apologize for this being so long. You can edit and cut it down if you feel like it. But I hope you read it. In the late 90s, I found myself without a place to stay. It was of my own doing, but when you find out that your wife of five years has been cheating on you, and your only recourse is to leave, well, that's the way it is. I was living in New York City at the time, trying to make a living as a musician, both original songwriter and studio work. My wife and I had gone to college together, and had been together for three of the four years that we attended. We stayed together after graduation for another three before deciding to get married. As I mentioned, everything finally went south. She ended up sleeping with a few different guys and then threw it in my face that I was never home with her. Let me just say that being a musician or being married to a musician is not the easiest thing in the world. Your hours are crazy, you're always at music venues or bars or working in a studio at odd hours to fill the needs of whoever is asking you to be there. I was, and by no means am, the super famous musician that a lot of your listeners would recognize. But I can say that probably some of them have heard my work somewhere or another, whether on a record album or in a commercial. I still do it for a living, and I enjoy a decent lifestyle. Okay, that has nothing to do with the story, but I suppose it gives a little backstory. When I found out my wife was cheating on me, I obviously was devastated and realized that I needed to get out. What she had done was way beyond forgiveness, and I made the right decision then and there to walk away. The problem was, our place in Brooklyn was in her name, and there wasn't much I could do about getting the lease turned over to me. After many days and nights of fighting and yelling, I just picked up and left. Thank God we didn't have kids. Eventually, we did sort things out, but this story is about my travel to the West Coast, and what happened to me on the way. One morning, I decided that since all my commitments at the studios had been taken care of and I had no gigs lined up, I simply packed up all my gear in my blazer, wrote a fuck you letter to my now ex-wife, and I started my drive to L.A. I stopped in Pittsburgh to see some friends and told them what was happening with me and my ex, and I stayed with them for a couple of days. I should mention I was 28 at the time, so kind of young, but also pretty street smart and knowing what time it was. I figured I'd try to see if there was a way for me to make some money on the road to help out with my personal bank account that I was going to be relying on for quite some time. So I stayed in Pittsburgh. My friends hooked me up with a couple of places that I could play for a few bucks. After those couple of days, I finally made my way out and I got to a little town in Indiana. It's an area that I will not mention for very obvious reasons. 
When I got there, it was kind of late, I was tired and hungry. So I decided to stop there for the night. Found a place that had rooms to rent, as there were no hotels in town. I mean, this place was the epitome of bumfuck nowhere. In the daylight hours, I would find out that there was nothing but farming. A small manufacturing facility, a couple of diners, restaurants, and bars, but that was about it. Honestly, the biggest form of entertainment in the town was a roller skating rink. That gives you an idea of where I was. So after I got my stuff in my room, I decided to walk down the main street where really that's the only thing that seemed to be open. Oh, fuck, there was nothing else to be open. I went to this bar and grill, sat down at the bar and ordered a beer. The bartender was this really nice guy around my age and asked if I wanted something to eat and I said yeah, so he got me a menu and I just started doing the whole hey, where are you from, what are you doing here kind of a conversation. That always seems to happen in the little towns when a stranger rides in. I gave him the fast version of my country western and song, as I called it, and he laughed and said, Yeah, that kind of sucks. I kind of know how you feel. My brother went through something similar right here in town, and he doesn't live here anymore. He moved down south to get away from his wife. When he asked if I was going to stay the night, I said, You know, I'd really like to see if I could pick up a temp job for a couple of days and maybe make some more cash. They asked him, You know anybody around here that would hire somebody as an extra hand for a day or so? He said some of the farmers were always looking for guys and that he could ask around with some of them who he knew would be coming in later that night. We got to talking music and I told him that that's what I did for a living and he just said, no shit. And he said, once in a while we do live music here, but it's so far from a lot of other places it's hard to get guys to come out in the middle of nowhere where we are. He asked what I played and I told him and he said, seriously? And I said, yeah. And he said, you up for an audition? I think I might be able to solve your problem. So basically, I ran back to my truck, grabbed one of my acoustics from its lock case, and walked back to the place. There wasn't a lot of people there yet. It was a Thursday night. But I'll never forget, I played him a Hank Williams Jr. tune, a Tom Petty tune, and then a slower Garth Brooks tune, uh, the one that's called Somewhere Other Than the Night. He just looked at me and said, Well, I'll be damned, you weren't kidding. A couple of the other people that were there shooting pool had stopped and listened, and they also clapped. The bartender, who I'll call Russ for this story, said, I tell you what, tomorrow night you can play here. I've got an old speaker system and some microphones, and I'll give you three quarters of what I get at the door. If it works out and you feel like it, come back on Saturday night for the same thing. I just looked at him, and he said, Does that sound good? I was blown away. I couldn't believe how nice this guy was being and how perfect this was working out. I told him, honestly, three quarters of the door is a lot. And he said, hey, don't worry, you know where you are. I think you can imagine how much people drink around here. I'll do fine at the bar. I asked him how many people he could get in there, and he said, "Eh, between 150 and 200. My joint's the only one that stays open past 11. I did some mental math and figured if he was charging like three bucks at the door, I could clear like 600 bucks. For two nights work back in a place like that and I'd never been, I thought that was pretty good. It got to be around 11, and I was even more tired but figured I'd have one more beer and some of the other locals had been filtering in and saw my guitar next to me and asked if I was playing. Russ just looked at him and said, not tonight but tomorrow you gotta come back and hear this guy. They said, is he any good? Russ just nodded and said, yeah, I think he's real good. They just gave me another look like I was from another planet and said, all right, and wandered back to the pool tables. Russ and I worked out a deal that I would go on at 9.30, play for an hour or so, take a short break, and then play another set as long as I wanted to. We shook hands and I said I couldn't thank him enough for this hospitality, and he just said, no, you know what, it's nice to have someone from not around here, and the fact that you can play some music for all of us country boys is really great. I was on cloud nine. I walked back to my room, went through a few of my old song books I had brought with me to try to remember some of the tunes that I had played, because I wanted to do more country stuff and not as many originals, obviously. I finally went to sleep and slept great. The next morning, I got showered, went back downtown and found a greasy spoon for some breakfast, and saw that Russ had put up a sign in the window of his place that said live music tonight. I smiled and thought that was really cool. 
After breakfast, I went and got a haircut, and it seemed like everybody knew that I didn't belong there and was wondering who I was by the way they were looking at me. Things were going cool at this point, but they were to take a creepy turn pretty quick. That night I went to the bar, and Russ had set up some small PA speakers and had two microphones. I adjusted one for my guitar, one for my Vox, and I ran them through this really old amplifier that I was sure was not going to work. But when I started strumming and singing and playing around with the mix, it didn't sound too bad. He gave me a thumbs up from the bar, and I was ready to go right at 9.30. It was a good time. I was nervous at first because of a different crowd, but as more and more people came in, the more I relaxed and just got into a groove. People kept coming up and requesting songs I didn't know, and they just kept saying, well, you can play them when you come back next time. It honestly was just like that line out of the Blues Brothers, and it made me smile, like I was going to come back to this place after I got to California. During my first break, a woman came over to me and said, hey, I really like how you sound, and introduced herself as Lynn. Oh boy, let me tell you about Lynn. She was very cute and very nice, but very flirtatious, and I noticed that straight away she wanted all of my attention. That should have been a red flag. We talked for a while before I had to go back up, and she said, maybe we can talk when you're done. I said, sure. I mean, what else was I going to say? So I went back up and played for another an hour and a half with more requests and songs I didn't know. I wrapped up, and the place was closing at once, so Russ and I squared up money, and he was 100% straight with me. He gave me 350 bucks. I've played a lot of gigs before and after this, and for a middle-of-a-nowhere joint to hand over that kind of money in the 90s was unheard of. There were gigs that I had played locally and weekly in New York that I didn't get that much money for for one night's work, but I wasn't complaining. So I think you can see where this story might be going now when I say that Lynn came back over to talk to me some more, and we had a couple of beers as things were winding down and people were leaving. Russ said, Hey, Offer's open, man. You want to come back tomorrow? I said, sure. Lynn asked me if I would walk her home as she usually had someone do that. And why wouldn't it be me? I did, and of course my hormones took over when I realized what she was looking for all along. I spent the night with her and got up in the morning to leave, and she asked if I wanted to get together again later that night. I said, sure, I gotta play first, but that'd be cool if you came back. In the back of my mind, I was thinking I might just get my money and get on the road, even though it would be late. I tried to remember some of the songs people asked me to play when I went back to my room, but before I could do that, I walked past my truck to get another guitar out. I couldn't help but notice that there were not one, but two dead skunks on the hood and windshield of my truck. It smelled fucking awful. The town was so small, it didn't have a car wash or anything like that. But as I drove around looking, I went past a farm where I saw a guy using a power washer on some equipment. I pulled up, I asked him if I could use his for 20 bucks, and he was really cool. Said, sure, and I can help you. He had some heavy-duty cleaner that he had dumped on my truck, and I sponged it around trying to get the smell gone, and I cleaned up everything else, too. I mean, it worked pretty good, but that smell is so hard to get out. He asked, how the hell did that happen? I said, I don't know. I came out to my truck this morning and saw that they were there. He shook his head and said, man, that's a damn shame. We shook hands, exchanged names, I gave him the 20 bucks, and I thanked him over and over again, and he said, no, that's all right, and then I went back to my room. Later, I went out to get another bite to eat, and when I went back to my room, once again, I noticed something wrong with my truck. Two of the tires were deflated, and there were some words in the dust that had already been kicked up onto the tailgate. It just said, get out while you can. Like a moron, I limped the truck up the street to the only gas station in town, and they helped me fill my truck tires with air. After that, I drove to the small parking lot next to the bar and left it there after getting my guitars out and taking them to my room. I figured if I left it there, more people would see it, and whoever was fucking with it wouldn't be so bold to do it in a populated area. And then again, when I say populated, I mean somebody walking by every 15 minutes or so. That night again was great. I made another 300 bucks, shook hands with Russ and a bunch of people from the town who were really nice to me and said, you know, I may be back someday. A bunch of people asked where I was headed and I told them my story and they wished me good luck. 
Lynn was there, of course, and I went home with her again, of course, being the idiot that I was. We had sex again, and sometime a couple of hours later, I heard a noise in her bedroom, which was a house in a little shady street off the main drag. I thought it was just her getting up. Nope. To be honest, I never even got or saw these guys' faces. I was dragged off the bed, slammed down onto the floor, and immediately got pummeled. I mean, this was an ass-kicking of a lifetime. I was kicked in the head, in the back, got even in my ass, everywhere. While I kept yelling, stop, stop, what the hell? I was dragged out of the bedroom, cracked my head on the doorframe, and was dragged into the living room, where there was a lamp on in the corner. The two guys stood over me and said, we told you to get out, or else, now you better fucking do it, boy. One guy plunged a knife right into the floor next to the side of my head. I nearly shit myself. Throughout all of this, I looked over and noticed that Lynn was calmly sitting on a couch not five feet from me watching. The two guys turned around quickly and left me there bleeding, and I rolled over onto my side away from the knife. I looked up at her and said, what the fuck was that? She just lit up a cigarette, looked at me and said, oh, that's my ex-boyfriend, he gets a little jealous. I looked back at her and said, you're not going to fucking help me? And you're fine with them kicking the shit out of me? I'm not making this up. She just shrugged and said, well, not much I can do. Every time I go to the police, they just let them go. And again, I'm not lying. And to this day, I swear to God, I heard her mutter under her breath, but loud enough for me to hear. At least he didn't kick my ass tonight. I went to the bathroom and saw my face was swelling up, but didn't have any teeth missing. Outside of the cut on my head from banking it off the door, I knew I would heal up, and I only suffered a bunch of bruises. I knew I was going to be sore the next day. Guys were pretty smart. Didn't leave any serious marks. But then again, who the fuck was I going to go to and report this? I just grabbed my stuff, walked out the door without even saying anything to Lynn, as she just sat there smoking. Went back to my room, took another shower, left the money I owed for the next day, and then went out to my truck at the bar. There was another truck blocking it in, and my heart sank. As I walked up to it, I couldn't see in the window, so I just put my clothes and stuff in the front seat of mine, not caring to pack it properly. I didn't even look over when I heard the window roll down in the passenger side of the truck behind me. In the same voice that I had heard in Lynn's living room, they just said, Good choice. Get out. The truck backed up and I didn't say another word. Just got into my blazer and started making my way down this main street before stopping to check my map. I knew I had to travel a little bit before finding another crossroad to get me back onto the interstate. And that truck followed me all the way down the street and stopped right behind me when I parked. When I figured out where I had to go, I got out of town and the road widened a little bit, but that truck stayed right on my ass for a mile or two outside of town. Then it pulled up alongside me and started doing that jerking motion over towards me like they were going to try to run me off the road, but they didn't quite do it. They came pretty damn close. I was freaking out. How long were these guys going to follow me? Were they going to wait until we were far out of town, knock me off the road and kill me? Fuck, I wasn't putting anything out of my mind at that point. Finally, I got to the crossroads of where I needed to go, so I slowed down, hit my turn signal, but the truck stayed on the side of me, and then a bunch of beer cans hit the hood of my truck, and I heard them laughing. When I made the turn, the truck, thank God, didn't follow me, and I got back on the interstate with no problem. I drove until noon the next day, wanting to put as many miles behind me of that town as I could. I didn't mean this story to be one about getting down on a little hick town, because I've played a lot of them, and I've played in much hairier and scarier neighborhoods all through California, the Midwest, and the Southwest. Hell, that place made some places in Chicago look like heaven. A lot of places are scarier than that, but at the time of my life, it was by far the most terrified I had ever been. I mean, even after the beating, I could not get it out of my head that they were going to do something else when we finally got out on the open road. Just goes to show you, no matter where you go, there are really great people and there are really bad people. It's not like they're all living in one area. It's been nearly 30 years since that happened, and I've actually written two songs about it. I still play professionally, 
never really did make it big, but I made a name for myself out there too, and I'm making a very nice living. Once in a while, I'll even play one of those songs that I wrote. But when I do look back, I still have so many thoughts bouncing around in my head. I mean, what if I had put up more of a fight? What if I hadn't have left that town right away? Would anyone really have helped me if I had gotten really messed up? I mean, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I honestly think there was a possibility that I might just have disappeared out in the middle of nowhere. I guess the moral of the story is, don't be so trusting, even when other people are treating you well. No matter where you go, there's always a snake in the grass. Scary Camping Trip, submitted by Shay. Last May, I went on a camping trip with one of my friends who I've known since seventh grade for two reasons. One being that her and her family always go to this camping trip every summer, and the other reason being that we were graduating high school. It was at a campsite in Colfax, California, by the Bear River, which was in walking distance of the river and was surrounded by breathtaking landscapes. To get to our site, we had to drive up a somewhat windy road that took us right to a small parking lot which directly faced our site and was connected by a little bridge with a creek running underneath. When me and my friend Sam arrived, her mom and her friends had already set up their tents and were chilling at a table playing a card game while eating snacks and playing some country music. We got to our spot and saw a man and a woman a few sites away from us, but we could tell they weren't supposed to be there. You see, in order to stay at these campsites, you have to pay to stay at each site. And I don't mean to sound like I'm making false assumptions about people, but it was obvious that they weren't supposed to be there, as they looked like they had hadn't showered in a while and were going to sleep in a hammock between two trees in spite of how cold it got at night. Plus, the man had a small but what looked like a very sharp machete that he was using to cut down some of the bushes and little trees over by where they were. Me and Sam actually didn't think much of it at first, but her mom and her mom's friend came over to us and talked about how you know, it didn't seem like they belonged there. We didn't want to interfere with them. I mean, in other words, go over there and tell them to get the hell out. So, later on, the four of us drove down to a beach area to just chill at the river. As we were driving, we saw the park ranger driving our way. So Sam's mom stopped the ranger and told him about the people by our site and how they could be in a site that other people had already paid for. Plus, the guy had a freaking machete cutting down trees and stuff as if he was an Indiana Jones. The ranger thanked her for letting him know and that he would go take care of it. Relieved of the worry that random people with a machete were no longer going to be there, we went to the beach, sat in our chairs in the water, and just sat back talked and watched the absolutely gorgeous view of all the forestry around us, as well as the cold blue water steadily rushing by. Everything was peaceful, until the next day, Saturday. Sam and I were sitting at our table playing Yahtzee and listening to our beloved underground rap music, and this huge RV pulled up in the parking lot. This Australian couple came out and talked to Sam's mom and her friends. They seemed to be a very nice couple who were taking a trip across the U.S. But of course, being the spooky person I am thought, what if they were actually campsite murderers that befriend people around them and then slaughter them in their sleep? I told my friend that, and she said she was thinking the same thing. We both laughed and joked about it for a little bit, knowing that the seemingly crazy conspiracy might just have been true. After the couple went back to their RV, my suspicions of them still stuck in my mind but faded as nighttime came upon us. Another couple set up camp where the other two had put their hammock the day before. Sam and I set up our own campfire, and we ate dinner, roasted marshmallows, and talked about high school. It was finally coming to an end, and we were talking about the future. All of a sudden, Sam looks as she was facing the small bridge and said, What the hell? So I turn around and see the same man from the day before that was there with his girlfriend walking over the bridge, passing by us to the new couple, who were also at the time eating their dinner by their bonfire. 
Strangely enough, the guy walked up to the couple, sat by the fire, and they gave him a plate of food. They conversed for about half an hour while the man ate. Sam and I were confused as to where that guy's girlfriend was. She was nowhere in sight, and why he had gone straight to that couple. Sam's mom walked up to us and was also confused as to why he was there again, and wondered how that he and the couple knew each other. The whole vibe was really weird, to say the least. So Sam's mom offered to move our tent to where her mom and her friend's tents were. We insisted everything was okay. Her mom walked back over to their table, and the guy walked back to his notably red truck, still with no girlfriend in sight, and he just drove down the road. This is where things really get weird. I watched him go down the road. However, I saw that the taillights blinked, indicating that he had stopped in the middle of the road. Might I add the road was pitch black and added to the creepiness, so I just said, Did you see that? And Sam said, No. What happened? I told her that he had stopped in the middle of the road, and she was also like, What the fuck? I never saw him drive away, but apparently he did, because about ten minutes later, he slowly drove back up to the parking lot, stopped his car towards our direction, then turned around and then drove down the road. Sam and I looked at each other again like, what the fuck? And she said, did you guys see that? And she was talking to her mom and friends, and they said they did see it. A few minutes later, he did the same thing. Slowly drove up, briefly stopped his truck, and then drove back down the road. He kept doing that every 10 or 20 minutes, and that conspiracy that me and Sam thought about came back to haunt us. Now she was freaking out, and I was kind of laughing it off, but I got to admit I was getting a little anxious. My body even showed it because my fingertips and toes had gotten super cold, which always happens when I get anxious. Then of course, here he comes again, but this time he stayed on the road, stopped his truck, and then drove up the road opposite to where he usually went. What made it even worse was that it may have been dark on that road, but we were equipped with flashlights and had a few fires going on, so we could see the roadway in front of us and the parking lot, just not so much of the stretch of the road that he had gone down. With that being said, we could see this guy staring directly at us while driving by with a bunch of crap in the back of his truck. Again, no girlfriend. Sam stayed on the question of where the hell the girlfriend went as we hadn't seen her all day since the day before. Apparently, the husband of Sam's mom's friend had a gun somewhere, so we felt a bit safer with him around. Plus, Sam's mom's boyfriend at the time had a few baseball bats to hit some balls with if needed. Even with all the protection we had, and the projection that the guy wasn't actually going to do anything, I still felt super creeped out and teared up a little the thought that we weren't going to leave that place alive the next day. Sam's mom and her friend came over and told us that they too were getting freaked out and offered to take us home, but we ended up just staying the night and we did move our tent closer to Sam's mom's tent to feel safer. As we were doing that, though, this guy, of course, drives up, drives away again, which indeed made us further worry. I wish I was as chill about it as Sam, but... Nope. During the night, I kept listening to those noises around us and tried to fall asleep. However, I was scared awake to the point that I had sat straight up with my eyes wide open and heard the noise of two fishermen walking down a path that led to a little fishing spot. However, I swore I heard that truck driving on the road once or twice. After a while of calming myself down, I fell back asleep and woke up at around 6 or 7 when everyone else was already awake. While we ate breakfast and just chilled, the strange guy drove up and away again, and Sam's mom's friend had told us that he had been doing that ever since they first got up, which led us to believe that there was a good chance he had been doing it all night as well. So we packed up all of our stuff after me and Sam explored down a path and found a cool hidden beach spot. While we were driving down the road to leave, the guy was driving his red truck again up the road to our site. As we passed by him, 
He glared straight at us through his window, so hard that he actually turned his head to us while we were passing by. And there was still no girlfriend. I caught that incident on video, actually. Fortunately, this was the last time we ever saw him, but it still scared the hell out of me. I actually thought we were going to be chopped up that night by that guy. Me and Sam now joke about how we were nearly murdered on that trip from time to time. And we're actually going camping at the same place this upcoming weekend. I really hope that guy isn't there. I mean, what are the odds of him being there again? The sound of those tires slowly driving up the road and his glare gives me the chills every time I think about it. Rocky Top by Utnox18 The first thing I ever remember happening to me of a supernatural type happened when I was about three, or almost four. We lived in a house my parents still occupy to this day, on a farm that has been in the family for over a hundred years. I'm 18 now, so this was quite a while ago, but I vaguely remember waking up in the early morning hours in my crib. I shared a room with my sister, who was about 10 at the time, and she was sleeping peacefully across the room. I got up and climbed out of my crib for no real reason, and I remember hearing a voice behind me saying, Give me back my house. It was an old lady's voice, and as I turned around, I saw what three-year-old me described as the diamond-faced woman. She was just a floating head that was diamond-shaped, but I do remember she also glowed blue. I screamed and ran back to my crib and covered my face with my covers, still screaming. My sister, being a sister, rolled over and told me to shut up while my mom came running in. I slept in my parents' bed that night. I didn't experience anything else really memorable aside from footsteps and shadows in that house. My brother shared a room and would complain about seeing people in their room at night, and one in particular was a man with a knife stuck in his head. Fast forward to when we moved into another house owned by the family. This house was lived in by my great-grandmother and then my grandfather. He passed in February, and the house really needed cleaning up, and we didn't officially move in until December of that same year. While we were cleaning and painting, all of us, uh, Dad, my mom, and one of my brothers, experienced different things. One day, while Dad was up working and painting in the hallway, he was also doing laundry and left the basket in the laundry room that was located at the back of the house. He went into the back bedroom to get something, but when he opened the door into the hallway, suddenly... The basket was now blocking the door. Just a small thing, really, but still creepy. I was up there alone one day and had just gotten done riding my horse that was up there for pasture. I would always walk in, turn on the radio perched on top of the piano in the living room, and go to the sink in the kitchen to get a drink. It was set up so that one of the doorways to the kitchen was right beside the living room. As I turned to go to the kitchen, the radio snapped off. This radio is one that fades once it's turned on. It doesn't just come on immediately. I turned thinking something had been unplugged or something like that, and as I got right up to it, the radio snapped back on louder than it was before. I instantly turned it off and went outside to wait for my dad to come pick me up. Once we did move in, I could never get settled. I didn't sleep very well at all, and my brother was constantly getting pinched or bothered in his room at night. One day, I was all alone in my room listening to music, and all of a sudden I had this pain in my knee. Not unbearable, just a pain, and I couldn't find the source. We had a dog, and she had started growling and looking above me. It was then that I remembered my grandfather would always squeeze my knee to pick on me. I just said... Please stop it, Pa. And the pain lifted, and the dog stopped growling. The most recent occurrence I've experienced after we had moved back into our original house, a family wanted to rent out the other one. I was going to bed one night, and nothing was out of the ordinary. My sister and two brothers had moved out, so I had my own room. My mom's job made her get up at 3.30 every morning, which is necessary for the story. 
I was having a terrible dream, and all I remember from it was that it involved my horse and him being injured without me being able to stop it. I woke up with a start, and right in front of my face were two green eyes, I mean clear, but just eyes. I closed my eyes tight and started trying to scream, and I could feel the fabric in my mouth moving, but no sound would come out. Something was holding me down by the neck, and it felt like a numb sensation where it was holding me. I remember being scared for my life and feeling dread like it was about to do something terrible to me, even worse than this. And then I heard the bathroom door right beside my room creak open, where Mom had gotten up, and it lifted and went away. I sat up and just stayed for a second, scared to move at all. Eventually, I got up and went to sit on the couch, and when Mom came into the room, she gasped and asked what had happened to me because I was so pale and gaunt-looking. I broke down in tears, telling her that I tried to scream for her, but this thing wouldn't let me. My mom is experienced in crystals and cleansing rooms with salt, and the next day while I was at school, she cleansed my room and put protective crystals all around. It took a while before I would go in there alone, but I started taking our dog to bed with me, and while she growled at something once, she since started sleeping with me, and nothing ever dared try to touch me again. I do have more stories, but they're more just little things, and stuff I've learned to ignore. Gross Office Worker by Jenny Lynn The story took place in an office building I used to work in. I was the receptionist at a cell phone company and basically made appointments for my general manager. They answered the main phone, you know, all the typical stuff receptionists do. I don't think it's totally important, but I am a female, and I suppose you already guessed that by my name. I was 32 at the time, wife, two kids, and enjoying a fairly easy job. We had hired a new outside salesperson. I'll call him Kevin. He was by far the best candidate we had for the job, and I remember he had a very impressive resume. If you're wondering why a receptionist was looking at resumes, I was the one who had to go through all that stuff that had been mailed in before human resources took over. I suppose I was privileged to see all that stuff, and I guess you would say part of my job was for HR, and I was supposed to weed out applicants based on sales experience alone. I got pretty good at seeing who was a salesperson, and who was clearly not. Kevin was hired, started, and immediately made an impact on our outside sales team. He was one of those above and beyond guys, and also helped with our inside salespeople, and even sat in on marketing meetings to discuss business and strategy. Everyone loved Kevin, and he was a great worker. After just three months in, Kevin was named Employee of the Month, and at the end of each month, we had a happy hour that my general manager would spring for. We would all go out to a local establishment for some fun and drinks, and we got to meet Kevin's fiance, a very beautiful and capable woman herself, and everyone liked both of them very, very much. The next month, I started noticing that Kevin was staying much later than the rest of the folks in our office. Usually, I would arm the security system when I left, as also part of my responsibility. I had to secure the office as the last employee there, unless my boss or one of the other higher-ups was still in the building. They had the key code, too. That happened sometimes, but most of the time, people left by 5.30. So, when I mentioned this to my boss, he said to give Kevin the code for the security system, and not to wait any longer for him to finish any work he was doing. They didn't want me to miss out on my family time, and they trusted Kevin to just lock up the building and set the alarm. Not a problem whatever. Kevin was a good worker and they trusted him to lock up. No big deal. So after a couple of months, as I mentioned, Kevin was staying in our building later, more often. That's when my boss got a call from the headquarters of our company asking to set a meeting with their IT person. They also wanted our IT person in the meeting, and as the receptionist, I just set up the meeting and thought nothing more of it. Two days later, the head IT person from headquarters showed up at our doors and said hello to me and made small talk for a few minutes. Then he said he needed to see my general manager as they had set up a meeting without telling me. I later found out why. I just said certainly, called my boss, and he came out, they shook hands, and went back into his office. Shortly after that, Kevin came by my desk and leaned over on the front of my cube. We small talked as well, and he said he was heading out on his calls. I wished him good luck and then got up for a cup of coffee. Then I just got back to my desk and went back to work. 
An hour later, my boss came out to talk to me and asked if I had seen Kevin, and I said yes, he'd gone out on his calls. He frowned and said, would you try to reach him on his cell phone? I said sure, and dialed his number on speakerphone. It went straight to voicemail. Obviously, my boss heard that. He frowned again and just said thanks, went back to his office. Towards the end of the day, my boss came back again and asked how hard it would be to reset the alarm system for access. Now, I should be clear that there are two things about the security system we had back then. Everyone had a swipe card that could access the building during the day. But if the security system was on, say on the weekend or after hours, the swipe card wouldn't work. You would need the access code. I told him I would immediately look into it and then kind of asked why, even though it wasn't my business. I assured my boss the security company might want to know. He said it was a precautionary measure and that we just needed it done. I agreed, made the call. Turns out it wasn't hard at all, and I came up with a new code that I would share with my boss. I walked back to his office and his door was closed, but I could hear him talking to the IT manager still, and someone else on the phone. I knocked on the door, went in, and shared the access code with the IT managers and my boss, and they just said, awesome, thanks so much, and that I could head out for the day. I said goodnight to everyone, got my things, and was headed towards the door when I saw a police officer and another man in a suit standing at our main door. I opened it and said, can I help you? And they said, yes, they needed to see my boss. I asked if he knew they were coming and they said yes, so I walked them back to my boss's office. They all shook hands and then closed the door. The next day I got to work and my boss called me in and told me that Kevin was no longer with the company and that under no circumstance was I to allow him in the building. I didn't ask why, and I said, oh, that's a shame. He was such a good guy, and I know everybody liked him. When I got back to my desk, I decided to clean up a little before I got to work, and I noticed a thumb drive on my desk that I hadn't noticed before. Honestly, I'd only found it because I was cleaning up my pen and pencil caddy and some post-it notes. I couldn't remember if it was mine, so I put it into my computer to see what was on it, and there were just a bunch of files with number titles. Just to be sure, I opened one up and it was a bunch of pictures, so I clicked on the first one and screamed out loud. It was a naked boy doing an unspeakable act to a much older man, and I immediately jumped up and ran to my boss's office, slammed his door open, slammed it shut, and he looked at me and said, My God, you're white as a ghost, what's wrong? I told him what I had just found, and he immediately jumped up, ran to my computer, clicked on another picture and said, we're getting a new computer for you. Take the morning off. Hey, take the rest of the day off. I asked him what was going on, and he said he would explain later. I was free to go and have a nice day off and not think any more about this. He apologized for what I'd seen, but asked me to not tell anyone. I did as I was told, and when I got back the next day, I was called into his office with the IT managers and the head corner manager as well. They asked me all about the thumb drive, and I told them it certainly was not mine, and I didn't know where it came from. Not long after that, the police in the form of detectives came into the office and asked me the same questions. IT stepped in at this point and said that the files had come from Kevin, they were pretty sure of that, and I told them that he had stopped by my desk the day before and had leaned over to talk with me. Everyone kind of nodded to one another, and I was brought into the conversation. Kevin had been trafficking child pornography for quite some time, and the police were on to him. He was using part of our system to share with people from all over the place, and that explained why he was staying late so much. It also explained why our IT department had noticed an uptick in bandwidth use, specifically from his computer. When our IT department looked on his computer, they found nothing because all the pictures had been contained on thumb drives or other drives. I sat in horror listening to this and was appalled by that behavior. We figured out that Kevin knew he was in trouble and basically dropped the thumb drive at my computer to try to give the impression that someone was using my computer to do whatever it was he was up to and maybe have an alibi. Yeah, smart thinking. Our IT people are a lot smarter than that. The police caught up with Kevin and found out that not only was he trafficking those photos, he was the person taking them. 
his fiance had no idea. They raided his apartment and found hard drive after hard drive, thumb drive after thumb drive of tons of children naked. Everyone was sick to their stomachs, especially me. He was arrested, confined to his apartment until trial, and subsequently was convicted of child pornography and got a huge sentence. I'd have to go back and look it up, but I know he is not getting out for a long, long time. What a creep. Anyway, I felt so gross after just seeing that one picture, and it's still etched into my mind. It's so scary to know that you could be working right next to a predator, one who's abusing kids, and you would never even know it. That company is no longer in business, and I'm actually a salesperson at a different company. I'm not going to lie. Every time we get someone new in the building, I am reminded of Kevin, and I know it's unfair of me, but I always wonder who or what is walking through that door. Who Was Opening the Door by Priyanka S. Early in my career, I worked in a city in southern India for a while. I had just moved to this city, and I was having a hard time adjusting to its extremely slow pace of life and the fact that I didn't really know the local language. Finding an apartment to rent was terribly difficult, and finally, after a lot of searching, I found a place. It was actually the large apartment of an old lady who lived all by herself and was open to giving me a room as a paying guest. It seemed like the best option since it was a safe community that she lived in. Her place was super nice and had all the amenities I needed. She spoke perfect English, so language wasn't an issue, and she was a highly educated lady. I enjoyed having conversations with her. Her husband had died over 20 years ago in an accident, and she had been alone ever since. Her kids lived abroad. About a year later, she suddenly took ill. She'd always been kind of fragile, but this time she got violent bouts of coughing, nausea, and random fevers. She stopped getting out of bed altogether at one point, and refused to be seen by any doctor. If I ever talked about taking her to the hospital, she would freak out. And this went on a while. Eventually, she called her daughter, and the daughter flew to India and moved her to a hospital. I found out a few days later that she had had breast cancer, and that she'd had it for a few years. She had always known about it, but had never told her kids. Until now. She hadn't told me either. I mean, basically nobody knew except the doctor who had diagnosed her. She had refused to take any treatment for it. She just wanted to die since she had nothing to live for. At least that's how she felt. A few days later, I got home from work in the evening and found out that she had passed away. The body was in the center of the living room when I got home, covered in a white sheet, and some pundits were performing some rites. All of her relatives were there, present, and her daughter had told me they'd perform her last rites the next morning. She also told me that I could continue to stay in the apartment and get a few flatmates if I wanted, and that she would be my new point of contact. After the old woman was gone, I moved into her room since it was a larger one with better light and ventilation. I didn't find any flatmates anytime soon, so I was alone in the house for a few months, and it used to rain a lot there, and the power would cut out so frequently that it just started to annoy the heck out of me. One evening, I came home from work during a power outage, and it lasted for over two hours, and I was alone in the house. I thought I'd just lie down on my bed and wait for the power to come back on so I could cook something to eat. But suddenly, I heard the bathroom door closing and the sliding lock being pulled shut. The bathroom lock was like one of those sliding rods that's attached to the inside of the door and slides into the frame, so it locks. I went to take a look, and the door was closed, and it was locked from the outside. The sliding rod had been pulled shut. I was 100% sure that door had been open earlier, but I decided not to overthink it and just tried to ignore it. After a while, I heard the lock slide open again, and I heard the door opening with a creaky sound. So I went out to the bathroom, and this time it was open, for sure. It couldn't have been the wind since every door and window in the house was shut. The rain was beating down hard, but honestly, it was not a windy day at all. 
Also, even if it was the wind, the wind can't really slide in and slide out this kind of lock. I was totally freaked out by this time, and I just opened the main door of the house and sat in the lobby till the power came back on. Couldn't sleep that whole night. I intensified my search for flatmates. I didn't want to be alone in that place for too long. Fortunately, a colleague of mine was leaving the organization, and her apartment was available for rent, so I grabbed the opportunity and moved into her place. I still don't know what that whole deal was with that door. Considering that this happened soon after the landlady had passed away, and it happened in her house, in her room, and that just made it all the more creepy. Scary Apartment Visit by Carmen L. I was single, I had just graduated from college and accepted a job offer in a new city in the Midwestern United States. Back then there wasn't any Craigslist, Google, or apartment search type websites and ratings, so I checked the local newspaper ads for affordable rooms for rent, circled ones that sounded promising, you know, price, utilities, on-site laundry, location, you know. I called the number listed, spoke with the landlords, and arranged visits for all of them. I had visited a few places, but was still considering my options, when another ad stood out to me. One room available in a six-bedroom house, good location, reasonable price, and residents would have full use of the gourmet kitchen and jacuzzi. I set up a visit one day in the middle of the afternoon, and when I arrived, I saw a tall steel fence around the perimeter of the yard. A man came out to unlock the gate. I could tell that he had some eyesight issues as his eyes were closed, or mostly closed, and he didn't make much eye contact. He had a lanyard hanging from his neck which was full of keys, and I didn't think much of it when I stepped into the yard, nor when he locked the gate with one of the keys, but after I entered the house, he locked the front door with another key and then removed it. I mean, who locks their own front door from the inside and doesn't leave the key in the keyhole? I felt uneasy, but he explained that he was completely blind, was very safety conscious, and didn't want strangers barging in. It seemed reasonable. He led me around the house, showing me the main rooms, feeling his way around the house with his bare feet, instinctively walking around furniture and through doorways. The gourmet kitchen that he, quote, built himself was splendid with every pot, appliance, utensil that anybody could imagine. Upstairs, the master bathroom had a huge jacuzzi surrounded by sanded wood floors, also built by him. Some woodworking tools were lying on the floor as he was putting some finishing touches on the trim, and it was impressive, but the bathroom had no door. He said residents could use it any time, and since he was blind, he couldn't see anything, so don't worry. I grew more and more uneasy. We got to the basement room for rent, and it was basic. A bed, chest of drawers, and a closet. He said the rent was cheaper in the basement because the windows were so small and high. It was a glass block window at about the seven foot height, and I already knew I didn't want to rent from him, but I decided to just stick it out and call him later. I was getting a bit clammy and nervous, thinking about the two locks. We were back on the first floor, and I saw a college-aged girl reading on the couch and said hi. She glanced up to acknowledge me and went back to reading. I asked the man whether all the residents had keys, too, and he said, No, I have the keys. If you need to go out or come in, let me know and I'll unlock the door. <laughs> what? From then on, I started praying. It got worse. No, this was way before cell phones, way before texting. I had nothing but my purse and keys with me. He mentioned in passing that he was a drummer and had built a soundproof garage out in the back and asked if I wanted to hear him play. I wanted to say no way, but couldn't think of a way to say so without sounding rude or scared. I decided if he was depending on this house looking attractive to a renter, he would rather keep the deal sweet for now. When we stopped just outside the garage door, I looked past him at the locked outer gate. I knew I couldn't get through it or scale it. I followed him into the soundproof garage, and then he locked the door from the inside with one of his other keys. The next twenty minutes, which felt like an eternity, I stood by the garage door while he pounded on his drum set till my ears were ringing and painful. The whole time I just prayed to God that it would end and I could get out alive. 
When he finally stopped, he asked what I thought. I just said, um, yeah, I guess I'm not really used to drums. My heart was racing. He let us out of the garage and even said that though the garage was soundproof, the police had to come to the house several times with noise complaints, which is why he keeps the outer gate locked. We walked towards Freedom in the outer gate, and he asked if I liked the place. In my sweetest voice, I said, It's so beautiful, thank you for the tour. I have a few more appointments, but I'll definitely keep this in mind and let you know. He seemed satisfied and unlocked the gate. And as I walked to my car, I heard the sound of the gate locking behind me. I could not get out of his driveway fast enough. I've always regretted that I was too concerned for my own safety to ask the girl on the couch if she needed help. I could have slipped her a note, silently mouthed something, anything. But I wasn't really sure if that man was actually blind. My Great Grandmother, submitted by William W. In 1970, my great-grandmother passed away. I was around eight, and I went to the wake. I wanted to say goodbye to her. So my sister, who was a few years older than me, took me up. I touched my great-grandmother's right hand with my right hand, and it felt like there was this white light just surrounding me. It seemed like I was standing there for over an hour. When I touched her, my sister wanted to pull my hand away and said, You should never touch the dead. Well, my mom came up to see what was happening, and my sister told her that I had touched great-grandma. Well, you have to understand, my great-grandmother and I were very close, for I was the baby of the family. She only liked seeing me. I made her a white heart that said, I love you, on it the next day, and I wanted someone to put it in her grave. I couldn't go to that. Mom wouldn't let me and said I was too young, so my second oldest sister stayed home with me. Someone brought the heart to the funeral. That night I laid in bed, and to my surprise, here comes great-grandma walking into my bedroom. She then took my right hand into hers and said to me, this is why I was not able to go to the funeral. In seconds where we were standing near the grave, I looked and saw my grandfather, mom, and all my aunts and uncles crying, and said, why are they crying? She told me they couldn't see her anymore. Well, standing there with my great-grandmother was my grandmother who had passed four years after giving birth to my mom, and by them was my great-grandfather. Great-grandma then told them and me that it was time to go back. A second later I was back in my bed, and she told me everything was going to be all right. Then she walked out of the room, and I yelled out, Don't go! My mom rushed into my bedroom and asked what was going on and I told her that great-grandma had just walked out of the bedroom, seconds before she came in. She had gotten the heart I made her, and said on the back, I love you, great-grandma. My mother just smiled. Years passed by, and in 1994, I bought a house and moved in. One of my brothers was enlisted in the army, and he came home for a class reunion, but I wasn't able to go, so I asked another brother to maybe take me out to see him. That wasn't possible. So I wrote to my brother that day and told him that because I wasn't able to see him, I won't be able to talk with him anymore. I don't know why I said that, but that's what I wrote. A few days later, my brother was found dead the day after his birthday. On the morning at 4 a.m. of the day they found him, great-grandma had come into my bedroom and I woke up crying that one of my brothers was dead. At 6 a.m., my oldest sister called me to tell me, and I told her before she could get it out. I told her that I knew Steve had passed, and she asked how. And I reminded her that great-grandma comes to tell me. She did, and told me then. My dad passed after that, and my mom in 1999. Once more, my great-grandma came into my bedroom with her to say goodbye to me. I was up when the call came from my oldest sister, once again, to tell me that it was 6 a.m., and Mom had passed at 5, except she was already with my great-grandmother at 4.30 when I had seen them both. Once more, she asked me how I knew this, and I said to her, Look, I've told you before. Great-grandma came to see me hours before, but usually it was just great-grandma. 
Then she told me about Steve. And then this time with Mom, she brought Mom along to say goodbye to me. That was the last time my great-grandmother ever came to see me. I'm wondering if one of the seven of us pass, maybe she'll come to see me again to tell me before everyone else knows. Or maybe she'll tell someone else that I'm gone. Lost in the Boundary Waters, submitted by Renee. The story happened in Minnesota, a high adventure camp for Scouts area. One of our staff, I'll call him Dave for this story, had received a group of scouts that came up for a four and a half day trip. He helped the group to prep their equipment, showed the food, safety talk, map reading, and so on. Something all trail staff does before we take groups out. I believe it was on day two or maybe three of his trip. They were looking for a portage trail. A portage trail, for those who don't know, is a trail that links two bodies of water. So they could get to another lake or river by carrying their equipment across it. This one trail in particular was difficult to find. So Dave decided to walk down what looked like a trail to see if it led to the next lake. First mistake, going alone and not using the buddy system. As Dave walked, he ended up tripping over a log or a rock and fell down a steep hill and hit his head. He rendered him unconscious and he had a severe concussion. His group waited for a while and looked for Dave, but of course they couldn't find him. They attempted to use a marine radio to request for help, but they were out of range. So the whole group left to head where they had seen a ranger station earlier that day. <laughs> Mistake number two. They should have left one canoe with a few guys and supplies while the other two canoes went for help. By the time the group made contact for help, at least four to five hours had passed, and everyone figures that during that time, Dave woke up with that concussion. He said he yelled for help, but there was no answer, so he just wandered off deeper into the bush. At one point, Dave realized that he was lost. Lucky for him, he had good survival skills, and for three days, he walked in the brush eating berries, and no kidding, eating ants. He would occasionally see search planes overhead, but they couldn't see him. He was wearing his life jacket that was black and blue. If he had worn an orange or maybe a bright yellow life jacket, they probably would have spotted him. On that third day of being lost in the woods, Dave found himself in a lake and saw a group of canoeists, so he yelled for help and identified himself. But the group didn't believe him and initially refused to help him. I guess the group had heard about some convicts that escaped a prison that was kind of nearby, and they suspected that Dave might have been one of the escapees. Through a little bit of time and lots of frustration, Dave finally managed to convince them that he was a canoe guide, his official title was interpreter, and that he worked for the Northern Tier Scout Groups. They finally agreed to help him. We were so thrilled and relieved that Dave was found alive. Bruised, bitten by bugs, severely dehydrated, and a huge gash on his head, he was otherwise fine. So, boys and girls, please, when you go out into the wilderness, make sure you use the buddy system. And when you're on the water, wear a life jacket or a PFD with bright colors. That way, if something does happen, a search party would be able to find you easily. What Happened to My Uncle, submitted by Jennifer M. The story happened in December of 2009 and took place in a small town in Oklahoma. I'm going to be changing the names for privacy reasons, but my uncle I'll call George and my aunt, who I'll call Sally, both had issues with drug and alcohol most of their adult lives. Sally plays an important role later on, but most of the story is about Uncle George. George, as I said, had an issue with drugs and booze. And finally, in his late 40s, he cleaned up, changed his life around, and got married. His wife wasn't ever in very good health, and she had had a stroke which put her in the hospital and in a coma for about a month at the end of November. My Aunt Sally came up to see her brother George, and they ended up doing some drugs and drinking while driving around the back roads in Oklahoma. Anyone from Oklahoma knows that that used to be the thing to do. Well, after driving around loaded, they ended up wrecking the truck they were in. George, who was still drunk but okay, went to find help for Sally, who was curled up in the floorboards of the truck. 
It was very cold that night, so George went to find help. And a few miles up a road, he found a house and started to beat on the door of the house. And the homeowner was home. Her husband was at work, so it was just her at home. And Uncle George was scaring her as he was beating on the door and walking around the house trying to get her attention. I'll refer to the homeowner as Patsy. Patsy called 911 and was on the phone with them as George was trying to get in the house. He finally broke into it, but he was shot and killed that night. Police later found my Aunt Sally in the truck suffering from hypothermia and barely alive. The police found the drugs and alcohol in the truck, and from what they gathered, they had been doing all that when they wrecked the truck. George went to find help and did it in all the wrong ways you could think of. Being intoxicated, he wasn't thinking straight, and that cost him his life. His wife came out of her coma to find out her husband had been killed, and my aunt woke up a week later to find out that her brother had died. Patsy now has to live with what my uncle put her through, and the nightmare of that night and what she did. It has forever changed the lives of everyone involved. So, to everybody who's out there who thinks it's okay to get loaded and maybe drink and drive, think again, because you will change people's lives, and not for the better. My Scary Job as a Kid, submitted by Bazooka Joe 72 When I was 12, this would have been around 1984, I had a paper route that I did to make some money to blow on kid crap. Football cards, video games, you know, the usual kid crap. It was the typical after-school job. We had a paper box on my front porch, and the delivery guy would drop off everything from my route and I would deliver. I lived in a subdivision and basically had to deliver on five or six streets, which was a big chunk of it. Back then, a lot of people used to get the newspaper, not like nowadays. And I remember walking around with that bag, and on Sundays, it was super heavy with all the paper inserts I had to put in. I suppose that's irrelevant to the story. I'm just reminiscing. Sorry. So, I would walk around delivering my papers and collecting the fees once a week, or in some cases every other, or whatever. It was based on how those people paid. One elderly couple I delivered to always paid a month in advance, so most of the time I would just drop the paper off and would never really see them. That's kind of important to the story. I started delivering in the spring of that year and was enjoying it very much. That fall, I remember it starting to get dark on my route like it does every fall. This meant that a portion of my route I would do when the streetlights were coming on and the dark was really falling. Not like pitch black yet, but you know that early to late fall evening darkness. I lived in the northeast of the United States, so out here on the east coast it does get dark starting around 5.30 or so in the late fall early winter months for those of you not familiar with the area. Anyway, I remember one evening finishing up the street with the elderly couple that I was on before I headed home and I recalled seeing a white pickup truck with a big cap on the back over the bed. It was driving very slowly down the street, and kind of stopped, but not really, when it got closer to me. The elderly couple's house was third to the last house I delivered to, and it had stopped up the street, and then as I went to the elderly couple's house, it had caught up and then slowed down. I didn't really think about it, as there were lots of people who lived in the neighborhood, and a lot of the streets were across and through streets but I did make a mental note of it for whatever it was, just because they had slowed down by me. So I finished my route, went home, and that was it. It wasn't until maybe a week later that the same thing happened. The same pickup truck, same area of my route, same behavior. Stopping up the street and then slowly driving by me. This time I looked over at the driver, but by the time the truck did pass me, all I was doing was looking at the back of the truck. I mentioned it to my dad when I got home, and he said I was probably just being paranoid, but to keep an eye out. It was a very safe neighborhood, and he would always tell everyone, friends and family, about how all the kids in our neighborhood would run around until the streetlights came on, all year round, and how nothing bad ever really happened in our part of the suburbs. I can't blame him. It really was a safe place. I kept doing my route, and everything was going fine. I collected from the elderly couple like I always did, and it was the beginning of November. They gave me a Thanksgiving tip, which I thought was really cool because Thanksgiving wasn't for a few weeks. 
I do remember that about them. They always gave awesome tips around the holidays. I guess that dispels the myth that old people are cheap, laughing my ass off. That night on my way home after my last delivery, I noticed the white truck was now behind me and going in the opposite direction that I always saw it go. I stopped and pretended to tie my shoe because, for whatever reason, I thought I didn't want to know who was ever in that truck to know where I lived. I'm sure if they were really following me, they already knew where I lived. But as a 12-year-old kid, I had the stranger danger thing going and was trying to throw off the scent, so to speak. The truck went by me very slowly, and I looked up this time and saw two people in the cab of the pickup, but again couldn't identify them for the life of me. I was pretty sure it was a man and a woman, but again, I couldn't be positive. I told my dad, and this time he took it a little more seriously, and said that he would ask around in the neighborhood if anybody had noticed the truck or knew who it was. He told me that if it was one of our neighbors, he would have a talk with them and make sure that they knew they were scaring his son. I wasn't really scared, but my dad was a pretty protective guy. Although he didn't tell me at the time, nobody knew who was in the truck, and no one knew where it came from. Two weeks later, I was making my deliveries, and at this point in the season, it was dark out at the end of my route. I was coming up to the elderly couple's door where I always left the papers, and noticed right away that something was up. They had a motion light over their garage, so when anyone walked up the driveway, the light came on. Tonight, it didn't. At first I thought, oh well, the lights are out, but went on with my delivery, no big deal. I'll never forget that was a Friday night because the delivery guy stopped me the next morning with my Saturday papers and told me that the elderly couple had put a hold on their delivery. He didn't say why, so I didn't deliver the Saturday and Sunday papers, but was back again on my Monday evening route walking by. I was passing by the elderly couple's house when the door opened, and from the darkness I heard a woman's voice call out, Joe, where's our paper? I stopped and thought for a moment, and remembered that they had stopped delivery. I stood there for a minute, and the voice called out again, Joe, are you bringing us our paper? I started walking up the driveway, and again the light didn't come on. Again, I paused and called out the couple's last name, and the woman's voice again said, Joe, please bring us our paper. I stood there and said, I don't have any extras. The newspaper told me you put your deliveries on hold. I can go home and get my family's paper and bring it back if that's okay. There was a pause, but the woman's voice said, Okay, that's fine, we'll wait. It sort of sounded like the woman who lived there, but I couldn't really be sure. But I also wanted to make sure that I was doing my job properly. So I finished with my last two houses, went to my house and got our paper, and without saying anything to my parents, ran back to the elderly couple's place. As soon as I got to their driveway, I noticed the white pickup truck was parked in front of their house with no one in it. I did think that was funny because I remember it was running because I could see the exhaust coming out of the cold air. As I walked up the driveway, again, the lights didn't come on, but the front door did open and a large man came out and started running towards me very fast. I didn't recognize him, and it took me a second to get my bearings before I turned and started running across the front lawns. I look back now, and I'm thankful the snow hadn't fallen yet because that would have been a really dumb move. Over my heavy breathing and terror, I heard the footsteps of the guy behind me. And then I heard the pickup truck start moving and come after me as well. As fast as I was as a 12-year-old, I made pretty good time getting back to my house and basically launched myself up the porch stairs, rolled across it, and then banged into our front door. My mom came out and asked what was going on as I cracked the glass on the front door with my foot, and obviously she heard the noise. I just yelled out, There's some weird people after me! And we both looked off our front porch and saw the man jump into the pickup truck with the woman who I would believe was calling me for the paper was now at the wheel, and they sped off. My mom picked up my leg and dragged me inside and called for my dad, and they immediately called the police after my mom said something very weird was happening and that she thought two people were after me. The police came out, and I had to tell them the story, 
and my dad made sure that I told them about all the times I had seen the white pickup. They went to the elderly couple's home, but there was no one there. Turns out, they had gone on vacation, and that's why they had put a stop to their paper delivery. Whoever was in that white pickup had broken in, unscrewed the light, and pretended to be the elderly couple to lure me to the house. Police believed that whoever the couple was was out to kidnap me, but they didn't tell me that. They told my parents. I was thankful because that would have terrified me even more than I already was. My dad started following me on my paper route in his car for the next couple of weeks, and I know that must have been a giant pain in the butt for him, but he was again just protecting me. We never found out who was in that truck, or what they really wanted, but when I was older my parents told me what the police had told them, and it makes perfect sense now. We really believed that some couple was trying to kidnap me on my paper route, and went to great lengths and took a long time to plan out their weird plot and figured out when the elderly couple was not going to be home. At first, no one could contact the elderly couple because no one knew where they had gone, but when they did get home, they did tell everyone that they had gone on vacation. They reported that nothing had been taken from the house, a window had been broken in the back of the house, and the light was unscrewed on the front of the house, but that was it. Not long after that, I quit that paper route and got a job cleaning an office that my mom worked at. It was safer and actually paid a little more. Anyway, that's my story. It still freaks me out to this day. I have kids of my own now, and we see so much more of this stuff reported because of the 24-hour news cycle. As much as I like to think our neighborhood was safe, I'm starting to think that more stuff like this did happen when I was a kid. We just never heard about it. Everybody, be safe out there, and always be aware of your surroundings. Bad Luck with Guys, submitted by Dawn S. I've never had the best of luck with guys. I appear to have poor taste in dating. After separating for good from my kid's father after five years, I was ready to just be by myself. About three months of being a single mom, my neighbor approached me stating that a friend of theirs, Steve, would like to meet me. It didn't take long before he charmed his way into my life. The first six months were amazing. He began drinking more and more with his friends, and each time he would get extremely agitated and begin starting fights with random people. Slowly, our friends would stop coming around knowing how Steve got when he drank. This, however, didn't stop him from drinking, but now all the anger was aimed at me. It took the next six to eight months of build-up from name-calling and shoving to punching and choking. Suddenly, I knew I had to escape. However, the last time I escaped out of the bathroom window, he found me by beating up a friend of mine until he told me where to find me. Steve began stripping all of my clothes off when in his drunken rage and laughing at me, challenging me to go ahead and escape naked. The last night of abuse was extremely scary. When I noticed how much Steve was drinking before he'd gotten drunk, I told him my son, who was three years old, wasn't feeling well and that I was going to stay with him as he fell asleep. My plan was to stay the night in our son's room, pretending I simply fell asleep in there. At around 2.30 in the morning, I heard the bedroom door open. I lied there pretending to be asleep, and several seconds went by. I began holding my breath as tears started filling up in my eyes, and suddenly I felt his hand on top of my head. He grabbed my hair and yanked me out of bed, whispering in my ear, are you avoiding me? Once in the living room, he threw me on the floor and then accused me of trying to leave him and demanded to know why. Before I could answer, he angrily said it was another man and then told me that he'd kill me along with any man I chose to be with. Threatening to kill me was new for him. He started that a couple of weeks before, and I'm assuming to put me in fear and make sure I never thought about leaving. Then, as he stripped all my clothes off, this time ripping them off, he said in a low voice, I'm not going to kill you, but I am going to hurt you real bad. He punched and kicked me a couple of times before falling on the ground. He was obviously more drunk than normal. 
I started to crawl to my son's room, and he slowly crawled behind me, asking, Where do you think you're going? He stopped at the doorstep and said, Lay down and go to sleep. Don't think about going anywhere. After about 30 minutes, it appeared he passed out on the doorstep of the bedroom. I decided this was my chance to leave. I put on an oversized shirt, picked up my son, and slowly stepped over him. He grabbed my ankle and said, Where are you going? I cried in fear and said I needed to get my son something to drink, and he angrily replied, Hurry up. I entered the kitchen slowly, put my son down in front of me as I went to grab my purse and open the fridge at the same time when I heard him yell again, Hurry up! I picked up my son and ran out the front door with no pants on, no shoes, and no purse. I ran all the way to the police station, the whole time thinking he was right behind me. After hours, the way the police station is set up is you go into a room and push a button and talk to someone on an intercom. I ran in, put my back to the wall, and pushed the button behind me as I slowly slid down to a sitting position while holding my son in front of me, waiting for Steve to come through the door for me at any second. I thought for sure I was going to be beaten, but I didn't care because it would be on camera. On the intercom I heard, How can I help you? Then all I could do was cry. I couldn't even get any words out of my mouth. I didn't know how to explain. Two policemen came out to assist me. A female officer took my son to get him food, and I went with a male officer to make a report as he gave me a blanket. After approximately 15 minutes, I heard Steve screaming my name as they brought him down the hallway. I held my breath as if he knew I was behind the door, and about 30 minutes later, the officer came back in with his sergeant. At first I thought they were going to tell me to go back home and collect what I could and get out while Steve was being held for domestic violence, but instead they questioned me more about his anger and if it was any different than previous fights. I explained I did feel more afraid, and then they showed me a list in Steve's handwriting detailing how to dismember a body and a good spot to bury a body without being found. This had lakes in our area along with wooded areas not used. He also had best possible dates written down with past dates crossed out. I felt like I couldn't breathe when reading this, and didn't realize tears were streaming down my face. I looked at the cop and asked, what does this mean? And he just simply stated, that you're a lucky girl. Steve was charged with attempted murder and kidnapping, along with assault. I left back home to Arizona before the trial started, but gave a detailed statement before I left. Steve, of course, pled not guilty, but in the end received two years in prison. Approximately two months after sentencing, I received a letter from Steve simply saying, It's not over. You'll always be mine. Hey gang. I thought about doing something a little bit different when I do these longer volumes, and I'm going to start today. I'm going to go back into the archives and pick out stories I've never narrated, but I've heard other narrators do, that actually got me really interested in making my own channel. Throughout the video, you will see a GoFundMe listed at the bottom of the screen, and there is a direct link to the same GoFundMe page in the description below. It is a GoFundMe to take care of a really unique author in a time of need. Please check it out. And, without further ado, let's get it on. Dr. Ramsey by Sweet Mercy A week or so before my 10th birthday, I walked to the corner store with a $5 bill and picked up a jar of ragu for my mom. On my way home, a man I'd never seen before fell in step with me and began talking. Hi, he said cheerfully. My name is Dr. Ramsey. I'm a pediatrician. Do you know what a pediatrician is? I walked along silently, not replying, and fervently hoping he would take that as a sign he should leave me alone. Subtleties were not his strong suit, though, because he kept right on chattering. Are your parents looking for a pediatrician for you? Of course, you're almost a big girl now. You'll be needing another kind of doctor soon, won't you? That's okay, though. They can still bring you to me until then. What's your name? 
You have beautiful hair. I was just on my way to get some suckers for the candy jar in my office. Do you like suckers? Thankfully, we were nearing my house, so I ran forward, up the back steps and through the kitchen door. I didn't know it then, but that was the beginning of a very long, very scary ordeal. It didn't take long after that for Dr. Ramsey to begin showing up. At first, it seemed benign enough, at least to a kid. He would drive by nearly every day, smiling and waving. I told my mom, who said maybe he was just on his way home from work. But then, the phone calls began. My dad called me into the living room and sat me down. He asked about the day Dr. Ramsey followed me home, and if I talked to him. He said I wasn't in trouble, but that I needed to tell him the truth. I told him no, and he asked if I was sure. Could I be forgetting something? I told him no again, and he frowned, then asked, Then how does he know your name? I didn't know. It turns out, that was not all he knew. He knew my sister's name as well. And pretty soon, neither my sister or I were allowed to answer the phone. He called several times a day, and at first neither of us knew what he was saying. Then, one night, one of my brothers told us that he was telling my parents that he was going to hurt me, and later my sister. Things got complicated after that. My dad had called the police, but as this was before there were any stalking laws, there was not a lot they could do. They told my parents to call back if he tried anything. My dad then called a friend of his from back in the day, who happened to be a cop. For the next month, my dad's friend escorted me to and from school. Suddenly, life as I knew it came to a screeching halt. I couldn't walk to school alone. I couldn't play outside. I couldn't walk to Super America. It's sort of like a 7-Eleven for those who don't know. When access to me was completely denied, things escalated. It was around this time he began threatening my sister as well. Then, one afternoon, my sister, two of my brothers, my mom and I were in the kitchen. One of my brothers saw a glimpse of someone in the garage. They'd seen him too. Dr. Ramsey came bolting out of the garage, my brothers chasing after him. They ran all the way to Cherokee Park where he lost them in the trees. My parents called the police again, but nothing came of it. The only information they had was a description and a name that was almost certainly fake. A couple weeks later, we woke to find our dog hanging from the side porch. She was a gorgeous saddleback German Shepherd, born the same day I was. We were all devastated. The cops said there was no evidence it was him and ruled it accidental, but none of us believed that. His phone calls became more informative in the meantime. He would talk about who was home and who wasn't. If my brother would say my dad was home, he would tell him who was really in the house. He would also talk about the house itself, about the window in the kitchen he could easily open with a knife from the outside even when it was locked, and about the French doors that connected the living room to the side porch and how the lock could be finagled from the outside if you jiggled it just right. That night, my dad put in some carpenter nails at the bottom of the French doors until he could get a new lock ordered. My parents had to go to a company event for my dad's work. My older brothers were at a Saints West roller skating rink, and my sister was on the phone with her best friend. My little brother was on the floor asleep, and I was watching Devo on the midnight special with Wolfman Jack. It was late. Suddenly, the top of the French doors swung inward, and in the few milliseconds before the nails in the bottom caused them to snap back, I could see his silhouette. My sister whipped the phone at the television, and we ran upstairs. About halfway up, we realized our little brother was still asleep on the living room floor. So as quietly as we could, we slipped back down the stairs to get him. We all went into our bedroom and didn't turn on the light, and this way we could see outside. We watched out the window for a while, and when we didn't find him, we crept down the hall to our brother's room to look. We looked down and could see someone standing at the back door. He knocked loudly. What do you want? My sister asked out the window. He stepped back and said, Is this the Mercy residence? I have a pizza for delivery. Can you come to the door? 
She scoffed at him, declaring she was not stupid. She could see he didn't have a pizza, and she was calling the cops. He left. A short while later, my brothers returned home. We told them what happened, and they walked around the yard watching for him. They came back in, and things settled down. By now, we'd pretty much given up calling the cops, because it never helped. So we just went back in, each of us, except my youngest brother, who was still asleep, carrying a knife from the kitchen, just in case. Eventually, one of my brothers went into the kitchen to get a bowl of cereal as a snack. You know that sensation you get when you can just feel someone watching you? Yeah, he had that in spades. He kept looking around the kitchen, through the doorway, into the dining room, at the windows. He didn't see anything, but he could still feel eyes on him. So he went closer to the door to try to see better. The kitchen lights were reflecting on the windows of the door. It had three rows of three windows, so he still couldn't see. He stepped closer, and then closer again, until he was right up to the door, then cupped his hands on either side of his head so he could see. There, on the other side of the window pane, was Dr. Ramsey, smiling back at him. He turned to yell for my older brothers, and when he looked back again, he was gone. They went out again to look for him, but didn't see him. The next night, we were at the table playing Crazy Eights, and my brother was restless. My sister asked him what was wrong, and he said he always felt like any minute now there would be a boom, boom, boom on a door or window. Almost immediately after he finished his sentence, boom, boom, boom on the window right behind him. In the chaos, the two eldest ran out, but he was already gone. A couple of weeks later, I was at school and we were outside on the playground during recess. I was swinging upside down when I saw that now familiar blue Ford Galaxy cruising by, moving slowly. There he was, smiling and waving. He called my name and I ran to the teacher and told her. The school had been told all about him, and she took me inside right away and called my mom. That same day, my mom had gotten a call from the school office asking her to verify that my dad was picking me up, as he'd called to say he was on his way. He wasn't. Not long after that, I woke up one night thirsty, and I went down to the kitchen for a drink, and there, sitting alone in the dark, was my dad. On the table, a gun. He was tired of the police waiting until Dr. Ramsey tried something. He was tired of his children being terrorized. He was tired of being afraid every time he left for work that something would happen to us while he was gone. I sat with him for a time, watching, before he sent me back to bed. These events, and many more, took place over a period of around 18 months. Then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. He had vanished from our lives. The phone calls, the drive-by with the creepy waves, everything. For a long time, during and after the Dr. Ramsey days, I would have a recurring nightmare in which I would wake up to find him standing over me as I slept. It took a long time before I felt like a kid again. I found out years later that when he was calling, Dr. Ramsey would tell my parents that he was going to rape and kill me, and later my sister, and that there was nothing they could do about it. I don't know what happened to him when he disappeared. I don't know if he was in a car wreck locked in prison in a coma, but sometimes I wonder if the wait ended for my dad when he was sitting in that darkened kitchen one night. I don't know, and I'm not sure I want to. Strange People in This World, submitted by Hayden L. Strange things can happen to anyone at any time, so hopefully my encounter will encourage you to be more aware of your surroundings. This event happened to me when I was a sophomore in high school. I'm now a junior at university. It was a beautiful Sunday in late May, and everyone was excited for summer break. I knew that soon I would have to start my summer job, so I decided to go for a bike ride so I could have time to myself before I started working. I embarked on my 30-ish mile journey at around 3 p.m. The town I lived in at the time is home to the start of a long walking-slash-biking trail that takes you directly to a large, nearby city. I planned to ride the trail to the city, explore a bit, and then ride back before dark. I set off on my journey, and I was enjoying the late afternoon sun, as well as the sounds of nature. 
The ride to the city went extremely smoothly, no problems whatsoever. The problem started when I first arrived at the outskirts of the city. I should add that this is a very safe area, minimal crime, and there are many large shopping centers nearby, such as Sam's Club and Walmart, meaning there are always people around. When on the trail, you cross a bridge that goes over a very busy road, then immediately after crossing said bridge, you make a left at the path and it continues parallel to the road below. The path eventually connects to the shoulder of the road just for a short distance. So I was biking up the path parallel to the road and eventually reached the part where it connects to the shoulder. Where the path meets the road, there is an intersection with stoplights. I'm going to try and explain this part as best I can, so bear with me. I was going to turn right at this intersection, which would take me into the area with Walmart and Sam's Club. I glanced on the opposite side of the road, and in the left turn lane, there was a car whose passenger was standing on the road yelling and banging on the window of the person who was in the straight lane. I remember thinking to myself, huh, road rage much? But I made my turn and kept on my way, not thinking anything at all. Since I was turning right and the car with the road rage guy was turning left, that meant that they would pass by me when their light changed and allowed them to execute their turn. Sure enough, I felt that car come up behind me. There's no sidewalk on this portion of the road, so I temporarily had to hug close to the curb. Since I knew that they could be trouble, I kept my head forward and didn't react as they drove past. As they went by, though, I heard them yelling expletives at me as well as calling me things that could be considered offensive. I didn't really pay too much attention to them as they passed, however, but I did notice that the passenger's head was now outside the window. The vehicle was speeding quite heavily, but from what I could tell, the passenger had a dark hoodie or mask covering his entire face. I didn't really know what it was at the time, but I would soon find out. Before going any further, I should explain how this area is set up. Basically, from where I was, Walmart and Sam's Club were in the back left corner. If I continued biking straight on the street I was on, I'd end up behind a long strip mall. This is where those guys drove, and it was where I was originally planning on going. When I saw that that's where they went, I noped out and pulled off in front of some closer shops. I pulled out my phone and called my mom to tell her what was happening because I was honestly confused as to what actually just happened. And I wish this is where it ended. We talked for a couple of minutes, and I kid you not. The second I hung up, I saw the car pull up right next to me, and I remember thinking, what could these guys possibly want? The passenger opened the door and swung his legs onto the ground. It took a minute to realize what I was seeing, but the guy was wearing an extremely detailed devil mask. I was so confused, we kind of just looked at each other for about five seconds. Then my senses kicked in, and I pushed forward on my pedals to get the heck out of there. Devil mask guy then sprinted from the passenger seat to block me from going anywhere. At this point, he raised his fists and started to rock them up and down like what a boxer does when they are sizing up their opponent. He was about six inches from my face, his fists about half the distance. In these kinds of situations, you always think you're going to be tough, but believe me, when your fight reaction gets denied, it's hard to do anything but freeze. I wasn't sure if he was going to try to rob me or what, so I kept my eyes on his fists to make sure that they weren't going to reach for anything. I remember saying, man, what are you doing? Look, dude, don't hurt me. I know, it sounds pretty weak but that's all I could manage to get out. After several seconds, he jumped back into his car and the driver floored it, going down the wrong way of a one-way parking lot. I honestly don't recall if the driver of the vehicle had a mask on or not, but either way, it was still creepy. I didn't even think to get the plate numbers on the car, but what I do know is that the vehicle was a red Honda Accord sedan, maybe from the model year 2007. Luckily, a couple of doors down in the strip mall was my then-neighbor's business office, and thankfully he was there, being it a Sunday. I was able to stop in and explain what had just happened. So we both stepped out to look for the car, but to no avail. I called my mom from there, and she came to pick up my bike since she was in the area. I stayed in my neighbor's office for some time, and then I rode home with him. 
Our conversation on the way home mainly consisted of self-defense tactics, and he told me stories about some sketchy experiences he's had. He said one day he was coming out of his office, and there was a group of several people who surrounded him, blocking him from entering his vehicle. I don't recall how that story ended, but it changed my perception on what I thought was actually a safe area. Honestly, the experience was pretty spooky and all, but I would say I was more confused than anything else. I mean, first of all, it was the middle of the day on a Sunday, so there was a lot of people out and about. If these guys meant harm, why were they doing it when everyone else could see them? Also, they were menacing. I'm pretty sure they were doing it just to get a scare out of people, and I just happened to be a victim of one of their pranks. These pranksters will eventually mess with the wrong person, I'm sure, and that person will either beat them senseless or pull a firearm. I can tell you these guys did not seem harmless as I felt very threatened, especially when the masked man ran to cut me off. So, weird devil masked man and his accomplice? Let's not meet again. And I mean that too, as I now carry the necessary tools to protect myself wherever I go. For all I know, you could be listening to this right now since you probably enjoy spooky things. To wrap this story up, I urge everyone to carry mace, a blade, or even a gun if you can legally do so. And please, watch your surroundings. This situation seemed unavoidable, but you might be able to avoid other potentially dangerous interactions like this one. Summons, submitted by Ashley F. Let me just start by clarifying, I'm not crazy. This all started about May 2016. I was a big paranormal fan and curious about Wiccans, being that my mom was one. One day, I was googling simple spells that I could try on my own, and eventually lingered into black magic stuff. Well, I found a spell on how to summon a demon of your choice, and me being me was like, hey, let's try this. All that it said was required was a Ouija board, five red candles, or four red and one black, a mirror, and then I had to draw the sigil of choice. That night, when my mom left for work, I got everything ready and even waited till 3 or 3.30 in the morning to make sure that things were more spooky, I guess. I read the directions, placed the candles around the Ouija board, and sat the mirror in front of me and the board. Then I said the spell, and remind you, it came off a cheesy website that hadn't been updated since 2005. Well, when everything was said and done, it said the candles would flicker and I would hear a low hum and things would get really cold. Lo and behold, all of that was happening, and me being dumb, I forgot to prepare any bargains, deals, or questions. I blurted out, you could feed off my energy if you decide to stay. Now, I didn't sell my soul or anything like that, but a week or so passed and I was staying at a friend's house. I was cuddling with her cat downstairs while she and her boyfriend and her roommates were sleeping upstairs. It sounded like someone was walking in the kitchen. Then all of a sudden, my friend Cat started growling and hissing, and then took off running upstairs. I swear up and down, I saw someone just standing there, staring at me. I rolled over and went to sleep. Another week passed, and I live in Pennsylvania. In the area I live in, there's a haunted church and a cemetery that was built in 1860. It's notorious for its hauntings. It's called St. Joseph's, but everyone here calls it St. Joe's. If you ever visit, you'll get this overwhelming feeling of dread like you're not supposed to be there. You'll hear Indians yelling and horses galloping, women screaming, and some nights the bell will ring when no one is there. One night, three friends and I decided to visit, and when we pulled in, I instantly felt euphoric, like I was on the best drugs in the world. But when we got to the cemetery, we heard snarling coming from near me, and the galloping was heard. I was getting dizzy, I was feeling sick, and my one friend grabbed me to snap out of it. He was attacked, and later we found scratches all down his back, on his throat, and on his legs. The snarling got louder, and I was getting sicker. 
My other friend was clinging to me, begging us to leave. And I don't remember this, but apparently, I stood there laughing maniacally. And apparently, it wasn't my laugh either. My laugh sounds like Kitty Foreman from that 70s show. Yeah, I know, it's terrible. Anyway, my friends forced me into the car and back into a reality of sorts. I turned to my best friend at the time, and with a ghostly white face, touched her with my cold, clammy hands, and she instantly got a migraine. This whole thing scared the fucking hell out of me. A couple of days after St. Joe's, I sat down with my friends and told them what I did, and why certain things were happening. <laughs> they weren't happy. Let's skip ahead. August of 2016, I was babysitting my twin niece and nephew that were two at the time. I went and got them a sippy, and when I got back, their eyes were wide, peeled behind mine, and my niece says, Who dat? Flash forward to November 2016, and my two friends and I were experimenting with things we shouldn't have been. We went to my bedroom, which is three rooms over from the living room. We were praying something creepy wouldn't happen, but it did. They sent me into my living room, and I kept hearing tapping on the mirror, and as plain as day I heard, Do you really believe in God? This chilled me right to the bone. I could go on about the creepy things that happened since he's been here, but that would take too long. Since I've learned having him here, he's strong enough to kill. He's killed my little brother's cat because my brother called him out. This thing moves things around and can manifest wherever he wants. His face makes you question everything you've ever known. It's been about three years now having this thing with me, and most of my friends kind of accepted his energy around. I think mostly out of fear, in my opinion, I feel he's mellowed out. Recently, I've moved into a new house with some friends. and He doesn't harm my cats, but he does mess with my roommate's dogs and lizard. I've had to hang a rosary in the doorframe of my roommate's son's bedroom, and I've paid a price for that. To this day, we don't know the actual name of this demon. We refer to him as Mr. Not Nice, just to avoid conflict. Weird Nissan, submitted by Terry N. Just right now, this very minute, maybe 10 minutes ago, I pulled into a parking space behind a Nissan to use free Wi-Fi from a local business. As I approached it from the rear, both of the brake lights went on. I thought, oh good, now I can move up to get an even better Wi-Fi signal. And the brake lights went off. I made my final approach in straightening out my wheel, and one of the brake lights on the Nissan went on. I turned off my Ford Escape and then walked over towards the Nissan. <laughs> there was no driver. No kids in the car playing. No seats in the far back position, so I ruled out a prank on unsuspecting people like me but there was nothing there. I know this was before Halloween when I submitted this, and the clocks are still on their spring forward mode, so in other words, it's almost 5 p.m. and still light out. I decided to get back in my car and write this out, so you're the first to get it. Oh, and for human interest, this was outside of Toronto. I know I wasn't imagining any of this. I won't get out to look at something unless I'm convinced. How the heck were those lights going on? Violent Chase by Hella Saucy The other night, I was driving in the center lane of a three-lane city street. All of a sudden, a car came into my right blind spot and almost slammed into me. I looked over, and it was swerving in and out of the lane, braking abruptly. I honk, and I look over to see if the driver is possibly distracted, and I see that the man driving is drinking something out of a brown bottle. The man comes up to my side and is screaming at the top of his lungs. Not wanting to get involved, I make a lane change to the leftmost lane to get away from him. And I can still hear him screaming, so I turn on my rearview camera and I see the man swerve across two lanes from rightmost lane to get behind me. He then starts speeding up as if he's trying to ram me from behind. Once I see him inches from my bumper, I decide to run the red light I'm stopped at and make a right turn in front of the two lanes of traffic beside me, in the hopes that at this point, he'll just leave me alone. 
I look at my rearview camera once again, and I see that this man is following me, trying to hit me from behind yet again. I panic, and I speed off onto a side street, but I look back and he would not let up. He was swerving in the lanes behind me and was trying to keep up, and in the distance, I see a freeway on-ramp, so I speed over in hope of losing him on the freeway. The on-ramp has two lane changes that merge into one. I pass up a car prior to the merge, thinking that the car will create a buffer between me and this man chasing me. When I look back into my camera, I see that the man is driving in the shoulder on the brush to the side of the on-ramp in order to pass the other car and catch up to me. At this point, I'm driving close to 100 miles an hour, scared for my life, so I slow down and dial 911. I explain the situation to the dispatcher, and she recommends that I try to get away to safety. The man then catches up to me and begins coming up to the side of me on the freeway, and he repeatedly tries to swerve into me as if to ram me or run me off the road. I slowed down in hopes that he would pass me up, but he too slowed down, and his wife in the passenger seat throws a bottle at my car. For a second, I lose visibility as the car is covered in a brown, foamy liquid. I think to myself, surely, this is the extent of this road rage. And I look over, and it seemed as if he was continuing on the freeway. Ready to get away, I pulled off on the next freeway exit, thinking I could just leave the situation. As I do this, the man sees me and makes a four-lane change onto the exit ramp, and tries to ram me once again at the freeway exit. I'm forced to speed through city streets, and I finally end up in a red light, trapped, next to this man. I look over at him and I roll down my window. He is screaming at me, Why the fuck did you honk at me, you bitch? You trying to make me look like a bad father in front of my kids? You wanna go, bitch? You beep beep little bitch! His wife is also yelling at me, saying, Why would you honk at him in front of my kids? I look into their back seat, and I see two children in car seats. Since I was still on speaker with the dispatcher, she heard all of that and told me to just try and get away. At this point, I was done. I just wanted to get away from him, so I made a U-turn to head back onto the freeway. He followed me once again and almost hit a plastic construction lane barrier to do so. He's following me again and is trying to hit me from behind. Once I got onto the overpass to get onto the freeway, I glanced at him to the side of me, and I see that he is holding something up in my direction. Suddenly, I hear a very loud BANG! At that moment, the dispatcher on the phone screams, Did he shoot you? Are you okay? Thinking I was shot, I started screaming, He's shooting at me! He's shooting at me! He's going to kill me! realizing that running away isn't working. I stop, and the man sped off. Luckily, there was no broken glass, and I wasn't injured in any way. The dispatcher told me to pull off to a nearby safe location, so I went to a parking lot of a nearby mall, and I told the dispatcher the make, color, and model of the car, as well as a partial license plate. The whole time I was driving there, I was concerned that the man could be following me again but they sent an officer immediately over to file a police report. In waiting for the officer, I realized that my car's cameras are always recording, so I hit the save button. The officer comes over. I tell him my story describing everything in detail. I also tell him that I also have footage of the whole thing. We take a walk around my car, and for the most part, there's no damage. The officer then informs me that because I'm not injured, and because there is no damage to the car, there really isn't anything that can be done. I ask him if it was an assault, and he says because the bottle hit my car and not me, it's not an assault. I ask him if it's reckless driving, and he says that here in California, it's a misdemeanor, and that requires the presence of a chip officer to convict. I then ask him if it could be considered an attempted murder, because he was trying to ram into me, but he says this is just plain old road rage, and there's not much that can be done. At most, the officer said that once he had a complete license plate, an officer could go out and talk to this guy. 
I asked him if the potential footage could be helpful in getting this man reprimanded in some way. And he told me to only send the highlights and necessary screenshots, though he doesn't think anything can be done. At the end of all of it, I was extremely shaken up. I eventually went home and reviewed the footage captured by my car, and luckily I had the entire thing recorded. The moment he almost hit me, his wife throwing the bottle at me, his face as he was yelling at me, his license plate, and even him trying to ram me. It's all recorded. A few days later, the officer called me and confirmed the license plate I had in the video with a recording he had from the freeway on and off ramps. A week and a half passed, and there's no update. While I understand the law is the law, it is unacceptable to me that this man could be so overtly aggressive on the road, threatening my life, the lives of his children, and the lives of everyone else on the road with no sort of punishment. I was genuinely scared for my life, and in the process, both he and I endangered the others on the road. Ultimately, this has left me feeling very disappointed with the system. An act of violence was committed, and due to technicalities, the other driver gets off. I'm trying to keep my retelling as factual as possible, but this was a really terrifying experience. Even in the past few days, I still feel a bit hesitant about being an aggressive driver, overtaking people, changing lanes, etc., I'm never comfortable hooking. I really wish I could say this didn't get to me, but it has. One odd detail is that the man was taking pictures of my car before the bang happened. I mean, what could he possibly want that for? Has anyone else been in a situation like this? Is there truly nothing that can be done? Any recommendations for how I can at least have someone check on those kids? Like I said, I have full footage of everything. Just Looking Around by Cat-Like Typing Detected When I was young, between the ages of 9 and 15 roundabouts, my parents would take my family, mom, dad, me, and my younger brother, camping and cottaging every year at the end of the season so as to get better locations at lower rates. Invariably, We'd go with a couple or couples that were friends of the family, and it would be a nice group event weekend or longer. One particular couple, Dave and Karen, went along every year. My father and Dave were, and are, still fast friends. The year of the story, we were in a cottage on a small lake, about two miles in diameter. It was during a near-perfect autumn in, I think, the Southern Tier Finger Lakes region of western New York. It was only my family and Dave and Karen this year. One thing of importance to relate is that Dave and my father fancy themselves amateur architectural buffs and love looking at vintage, old, and historical buildings or houses. <laughs> Bear with me here. Often camping and cottaging as late in the season as we did, the regulars would already be gone for the season. Summer homes, fishing cottages, and the like would be prepped for the winter and locked up for the season, awaiting the return of the owners the following spring. To my father and his friend Dave, Looking meant breaking in to fully check the place out. They never did any damage or tamper or take anything. They just found the most interesting deserted homes, picked the lock or the latch, let themselves in, and looked at all the original woodwork or styling or whatever. Then they locked everything back up, as it was, and then left. I don't recall how old I was, but this particular year, it was apparently decided that my brother and I were old enough to tag along for the house they'd singled out. It was halfway around the lake. I remember everything very vividly, from the outside appearance to the door we entered to the whole of the interior. The rear door was locked with a padlock through a bar latch. However, the securing screws for the bar latch were exposed, rather than covered by the bar. <laughs> Three Phillips had screws out, and we were in. We wandered about the ground floor, and I recall the place being a bit musty and darkish, but very nice, if so cluttered. There were some comic books lying around which delighted me, so the owner must have had children. It took a few minutes, but my father noticed something seemed not quite right. It took a bit, but then he realized from an almost inaudible background hum that the fridge was still running. 
Looking inside, it revealed about a half case of unopened Labatt's beer bottles, an indication that the place may not be closed for the season, obviously. Oh well, the adults think. We're already here. Haven't seen any cars or activity the past couple of days, and only have the upstairs to look at. May as well finish this up. So we head upstairs, and the layout was simple. Stairway goes up one side of the house, and tops off at one end of a hallway that traverses the length of the building. It's the only way up or down. Off this hallway, and all to the left, are four evenly spaced doors. We entered the first room, and it was empty save for a massive brass bed frame. No box spring or mattress, just the frame. And by massive, I mean just that. My father and Dave marveled over the solidity and craftsmanship of the thing. Wide, high head, and footboards with corner posts that only barely fell short of making it a full-blown four-poster bed. All of it was welded. No screws, nuts, or bolts. <laughs> this thing was either assembled in the room or the room was built around it. There was absolutely no way it was brought, completely that way, into that room. I doubt it would fit through the patio doors if the entire door assembly was taken off in advance to clear for more space. So my dad and Dave are ooing and eyeing over the brasswork a bit more, and we move on to the next room, which is totally empty. We move to the third room, which was totally empty. It's becoming clear the family only really uses the ground floor while they stay there. We're getting ready to move to the last room, when there's this sudden, loud crash. First thought in all of our minds, the owners are back, and we are way busted. My father moves to the head of the stairs, looks down, goes down. Nothing. Nobody there. Nothing obviously out of place from what was remembered when we walked in. There was just nothing. Shrugs all around, we head off to room four with the general feeling of, let's look at this final room and then get out before we really do get caught. We enter the final room to find it completely empty, save for a huge, welded, brass bed frame. My father looked at Dave. He looked back, and Dave ran out of the room and down the hall. A moment later, we heard him cry out, so we all ran down the hall to the first room, which was now empty. I don't actually remember us getting out of the house, but I know it was fast, and I know they didn't bother to screw that latch back on. To this day, my father and Dave will both acknowledge the event, but won't talk about it, and my brother doesn't recall it at all. As far best as I know, that was the last house inspection they ever attempted. It Gave Me a Rush, submitted by Chad T. This is a true story that happened to me about 20 years ago. It made me a strong person, and it would be an honor for you to read it on your show, Uncle Josh. I was 19 or 20 years old when this happened, and I had just gotten off of work at a Sears Auto Center. I was tired, covered in grease, and all that good stuff that comes from working on cars all day. As I left the parking lot... I noticed a big older model Ford Bronco tailgating me. As I pulled up to a stoplight, I changed lanes to get this guy off my ass. And I felt the eyes of these guys gazing at me, and I'm not going to lie, I was scared. I didn't want to look at them. And then they started screaming at me, and I still wouldn't look. Finally, I was forced to look over, and once they threw a beer bottle at my car, I looked at the passenger, and he yelled at me, You cut us off, and now we're going to kill you, you faggot! I immediately said, uh, no dude, I didn't cut you off. Stop throwing shit at my car. The light turned green, and I thought they were going to follow me for sure. And I was right. Now, this was in 1998, way before cell phones, so I couldn't call for help. These guys were as close to me as possible without hitting my bumper. And it was about 10pm on a Tuesday night, so there was hardly any traffic on the road. I was terrified. I did, however, have my softball gear in the car, so I pulled my aluminum back close to me in case I needed it. These guys seriously wanted to hurt me, and I didn't want them to follow me close to my house, and I desperately tried to lose them. Their truck was huge, and I couldn't outrun them in my 89 Sundance. 
I thought maybe I would drive to the police station, hoping these guys would figure out what I was doing and then get lost quickly. However, I did have an ounce of weed on me, so I couldn't risk getting arrested again for weed. I decided the only thing I could do was call their bluff. If they wanted it, they were going to get it. I could hear them screaming and still throwing shit at my car for what seemed to be forever, but it was probably only like seven minutes. They kept calling me a fag, and I guess that was their go-to insult. I'm not a huge guy, but I'm not a bitch either. So I clutched onto my bat tight to my body as I drove, thinking about the best place to stop and get this over with. I pulled into a small cemetery that backs up to some woods, and the small road does a loop around the cemetery. One way in, and one way out. They kept screaming, We're gonna get you, faggot! and laughing uncontrollably. However, the laughing stopped when I slowed down and came to a stop. Once I put my car in park, I heard the guy in the passenger seat say, What the fuck? I knew it then and there that they were scared little bitches. They opened my car and jumped out aggressively. The driver then said, Oh, fuck this. Since I was blocking the small single lane road, the only way out for them was to navigate in reverse in their big ass truck. They had to reverse slowly as to not hit anything, so I walked them down as they reversed out. I said, where are you guys going? I thought you were going to kill me. The passenger, all of a sudden, said with a shaky voice, oh, we, we thought you were someone else. Sorry. I took my bat and smashed the headlights out of their truck. They were now both screaming in terror, and I'm not sad to say that it gave me a rush. They finally made it out of the cemetery, and it was over. Next day, I had to go to work again. It was about 11 a.m., and I got the work order for a headlight repair on a Ford Bronco. Yep, small world. An Odd Feeling by Emilio GTZ 2005 was a bad year for me. Not sure if the worst so far. I haven't really ranked them all yet, but... It was certainly a contender. That was the year my inner child died, the year I became a full-time adult. It was all the result of a downward spiral that started with my marriage in 2003, followed by the loss of my job and becoming a father in 2004. Work was scarce, and I started working about 30 hours a week as a freelancer, getting paid every two or three months. This was killing me. By the summer of 2005, I was homeless, jobless, and had lost one of my best friends in a car accident. Time had just stopped for me. and halted. During that time, days really didn't matter to me. My wife was unemployed too, and the weekends and weekdays lost all significance to us. I only took notice because my friends were still living in week intervals. Not too often, I would go and share a beer with them, and my friend was still single, so his house was the place we assembled at on those occasions. It was a hot Friday, and we were all drinking a lot, joking, laughing, saying all sorts of stupid things. And that was the four of us that night. The beer was about to run out shortly after midnight, and two of my friends volunteered to go out and get some more. Me and my friends stayed back at the house, drinking, singing songs. And all of a sudden, his expression became very serious, very stern. He looked sober. The stupid MP3 player ran out of battery five seconds later. How's your love life? How's your marriage? He asked me. I swear, he sounded like he had not drank a single beer that day. It was no secret my marriage was a train wreck. Even my not-so-close friends knew about that. But it was not the usual way we approached such matters. We used to go around in circles before talking serious, personal matters. I kind of felt a bit sober, too. Suddenly, and I'm not sure it was because of the question or the way my friend looked during that moment. Of course, now we were surrounded by silence. It's okay, I guess, I told him. He asked me, Are you sure? How is your relationship with your wife? I responded, It's getting better. I wasn't lying. Two days before, we had just received our eviction notice. For me and my wife, that was our first shit-got-real moment. I mean, getting pregnant had not been that hard. We didn't even fight over it. We talked. 
we made a plan. For the first time in more than a year, we had agreed on something. Are you going to make it? My friend asked. What? I said. I was confused at this point. Are you going to make it? Can you make it on your own? This question had a certain meaning because we, he and me, had similar backgrounds. We grew up as part of a tight, close family group, but our parents were not okay with the way we wanted to live our lives, so we received no support from them, and asking for their help was generally not an option. We did things on our own. Yeah, I can make it, I told him. With that, I meant to say I was not getting divorced right away. You're going to be okay, he told me. He sounded sad, and I was still unsure about what was actually happening. Then he told me he was going to our hometown the next weekend, a city about 200 miles to the west. He asked me to go with him, and I told him I couldn't because I had to deal with leaving the house I was living in then. He said he was going to visit his relatives and a girl that he was romantically interested in. At that point, the two other friends arrived with more beer, and they put the music back on, and the party went on. This was the last time I saw my friend. A week later, he called me on the phone. It was a Saturday night, and he told me everything had gone wrong with his trip. He got mad with his relatives, his date went bad, and he wanted to get back. He'd been drinking, and I told him to stay put and get back on Sunday. He said he agreed with me. We made a few jokes regarding his date and then ended the call. And so began the strangest night of my life. I was downstairs in the living room watching a movie, having a drink. The kid was asleep in his room, and my wife was watching TV in the master bedroom. It was around 10 p.m., and I went to the kitchen, got some ice, and then filled my glass. I felt a chill when I put the bottle back on the table. I stood there a few seconds, then shook my head and went back to the couch. I took a sip off my drink and tried to clear my mind, but then I realized I was fully alert. I stood up, turned around, and said aloud, Something's wrong here. The sound of my own voice scared me. I put the glass on the small table and went upstairs with a certain urgency. The kid was still asleep. Everything was okay in his room. Then I went to the bedroom. My wife was also sound asleep. Very unusual for her. She used to watch TV until 2 or 3 in the morning. I called her name and she didn't even flinch. So I turned off the TV and the bedside lamp. I went back downstairs, picked up my drink and resumed watching the movie. I felt very uneasy. I mean, half a bottle of whiskey had done nothing to me. At midnight, I decided to call it quits and turn the TV off. I went to the kitchen to leave my glass in the sink, and as I went back into the dining room, it was that chill again. It made me stop there, started looking around. I couldn't shake the thought that something was wrong, very wrong. I turned every light on in the house and went looking all over the place for something. Couldn't tell what, just trying to find out what was so wrong. I thought that with the noise I was making while going from one end of the house to the other, opening and closing doors, my wife or kid would eventually wake up. But they didn't. They remained fully asleep. After double-checking every window and outgoing door, I turned out the lights and went upstairs to the bathroom. There I found a copy of Dan Brown's Da Vinci's Code. (laughs) I know. I had received it a couple of months back as a gift from a friend. Well, that night, I started reading it. I went to bed, turned on my lamp, and continued reading. I realized I couldn't sleep. I mean, didn't even feel tired in the least. An hour went by, and I was becoming anxious again, to the point of repeating the doors and windows routine I had performed before. When I came back to the bed again, I tried to wake my wife up, but she wouldn't wake up. Again, this was unusual of her. I turned the TV on, but continued with my reading. It was now about 2.30. Then I started to feel really bad, really scared. I was sure something was about to happen. Actually, I wanted something to happen. An earthquake, an explosion, whatever. I wanted that overwhelming fight-or-flight feeling to go away. I went downstairs, turned all the lights on again, and as I stood in the middle of the living room, I had that thought again. Something was wrong. Something was very, very wrong here. 
and I couldn't identify what it was, and I needed to identify it, or that something really bad was going to happen. I went outside, walked to the parking lot, and stood there. It was a warm summer night, clear sky, everything looked normal. I went back to the house, and the VCR clock said 3.15. I sat on the dining room table and stared at the wood grain for a long time. Slowly, I felt the dreadful sensation going away. I slowly felt going back to my senses. You missed it, I said out loud. I wasn't sure what to think. I didn't feel that urgency anymore, but I felt guilty and kind of sad. I went upstairs, checked out my kid, my wife, made sure they were both breathing, I went downstairs again, turned the TV on, and I sat there until dawn. That Sunday, my wife had a party at her mom's, and she wanted me to go with her. I kind of wanted to go too, but I was just feeling very tired. She asked me what was wrong, and I asked her why she fell asleep so early, and if she had hurt me last night. She said she didn't know. I just felt like I was carrying something heavy, she said. I couldn't remember anything else. I couldn't sleep, I told her. I was feeling anxious and scared all the time. The expression in her face said that she thought I had drank too much. She left the house around 11 a.m., and I was in charge of cleaning up the place. I knew the routine, make sure everything was fine by the time she came back. I felt tired and down, but even though I had a ton of reasons to be depressed, I couldn't tell which one was keeping me down that morning. The call came about half past noon. It was one of my other best friends. He sounded scared. We need to talk, he said. I just received a call and I need you to help me. Where are you? I told him, I'm at home. He said, I'll pick you up in ten minutes. I was finishing tying my shoes when the doorbell rang, and I rushed to open it. My friend looked just like I felt. Without talking, we went down to the parking lot, got into his car, and we took the way to downtown. I got a call, he said, from one of my wife's co-workers. He struggled with every single word. I missed it, I thought. I missed it. Something did happen after all. He said last night there was an accident. It was reported on the AM news, and the car looked just like our friend's car. He thought it was him. I'm going to the morgue to make sure. So that was it, I said. What? he asked me. I said to him, I couldn't sleep last night. I kept feeling like something was happening, something bad, but I couldn't find out what. He asked, what do you mean? And I said, it's him. He's dead. He died early this morning. We identified the body. It was our friend. He had been driving too fast, they told us. Lost control while taking a curve six miles from the city. He didn't die instantly, though. Probably took him about a half an hour. A truck driver reported the accident at 2.45 a.m. When the help arrived, he was gone, but they missed him, just barely. Sometimes I like to think that my friend's death was just an accident, but that last conversation we had, was he saying goodbye to me? Did he sense his death? Did he plan it? What exactly kept me awake that night? Culinary School, submitted by Eric B. This was a fucked up experience I had about 20 years ago. I'd lost my job due to downsizing and realized that what I was doing in my life was not really what I wanted to do. My wife was and still is a successful corporate broker, and that afforded me the chance to go back to school to establish a new career. Ever since I was a kid, I was a cooking fiend and loved to prepare meals for my family. As a latchkey kid, I did a lot of meal prep for my parents when they finally got home from their very demanding jobs. With that in mind, I enrolled in a culinary program at a local community college. I was super stoked to be doing something that I really loved, and that I knew would provide a way to support my family. By this time, we had a two-year-old daughter, and I should say I was 27 at the time. I am by no means a come-hither beauty as far as guys go. Tom Cruise, I'll never be but I'm also very fit and pride myself on my appearance. I think that played a role in what I'm about to tell you. 
I was one of two older students in the program, as most people who were there were right out of high school. We were often paired with fellow students on projects, and this is where my troubles began. That problem? I'll call her Sandra. She was a very beautiful young girl, very ambitious, and took a liking to me right away. It was after our first project together, coming up with a variation on a simple recipe of eggplant parmigiana, that we got to know one another. It wasn't really a contest that we were involved in, but our instructors did reward us with paper accommodations when we came up with unique ideas. We got one, and both of us were very proud. She wanted to celebrate after class, and I obliged this request with a number of other people from the class. We went to a local bar, and after I called my wife to let her know, so anyone who thinks I was cheating, that was not the case. I realized that night, though, that Sandra had very obvious feelings for me. I did my best to play it off and make an early exit, but she followed me out to my car and kept saying how happy she was to be my partner and hoped that we could build on our culinary relationship. I'm sure some of you are actually laughing right now and saying, culinary relationship? But, yep, that's exactly what she said. I told her I hoped that we would both be successful, then got in my car and went home. Immediately, I told my wife about it, and she laughed and just said, and this is another quote, that Sandra was just a young kitten who was smitten. I laughed and let it go. Over the next two weeks, despite my not being paired with Sandra for assignments, I found her constantly behind me or next to me. When I told my wife about it, she reiterated what she had already said, and I kept telling her that I didn't understand this. She was a very attractive girl and had no reason to be flirting or messing around with a guy who was nearly ten years older than her. One night, I went out with our group to the same place that we had been before and had some drinks, and I asked that my wife come with me. She did and met Sandra and said to me afterwards that I had nothing to worry about. She was just looking up to me as some kind of mentor. I thought that was weird as we were both in the same class and I had no business being a mentor to anybody. This is when Sandra started calling and leaving messages on my answering machine at home. They were long and rambling, always about school, but had a strange twinge to them. Then she started calling my cell phone, which I had just gotten. I hadn't given out the number to anyone, but somehow she had it. She also started showing up at random places I was at, like the mall buying my wife a Christmas gift, the supermarket. One time she was standing outside an oil change place. She was always saying how interesting it was that we were at the same places. I told my wife, and now she started to think it was odd too, but what was I going to do other than tell Sandra to buzz off? Fast forward to after Christmas. My family and my wife's family had chipped in to buy me a set of Zwilling knives. I didn't know at the time, but I did shortly thereafter, that they were worth about 2500 bucks. Well, in our second semester, I was bringing my new knife set to class to use. I had excelled in my knife skills greatly since I was making a lot of food at home, and I loved the way those suckers felt in my hand and still do. One day, and I believe it was a Thursday night, one of my knives went missing. I immediately asked my classmates if they had seen it. It was a chef's knife, so something that was pretty easily identifiable. Everyone helped me to look for it, but no one could find it, and I was royally pissed and embarrassed to have to go home and tell my wife, who had spent so much money on it, that I had just lost it. I was seriously bummed, but kept going to class and doing what I had to do to get my degree and get placed in a paid internship program that would lead to a job. A couple of weeks later, I got bumped into by Sandra, and she said she had found a knife online and bought it and wanted to give it to me because she felt so bad that my other knife had been stolen. I said that was very nice of her and completely unnecessary and that I would pay for it. She insisted no, it was a gift, and she had gotten it for a steal, and that she had it in her apartment. If I wanted it, I could come over that night and get it. I agreed because I wanted my knife back, but I also told my wife, who agreed to accompany me to Sandra's apartment. We got there after dumping our kid off at our in-laws, and I went up the walk to see about the knife. My wife waited in the car down at the street, and after I knocked on the door, I heard Sandra say, Come on in. I was apprehensive, but went in and didn't see her right away. I called out to her again, and she said, I'm in here, I've got it, and I went through her kitchen. Her apartment was set up that the door entered through a short hallway, but then emptied into her kitchen and the rest of the apartment. 
When I got to her living room, there she was, literally splayed out wearing lingerie, thigh highs, and had a rose in her teeth. I stopped and said, um, I I'm sorry, I think you're expecting somebody else. Sandra just looked at me, after taking the rose out of her mouth, said, No, I've been waiting for you. That's when I noticed she was holding the knife, and quite frankly, it was my knife, not one that she had bought on the internet. I had made a special mark on all of the handles so I would recognize that they were mine. I started to back up and told her that she was going to have to just bring the knife to class. I was very appreciative that she had it, but I would forget about this whole episode and that would be the end of it. The anger that flashed in her eyes is something I will never forget, and I was so thrilled when the door to the apartment opened and my wife was suddenly standing behind me. Sandra looked at us both and started freaking out. She actually started to cut her arms and say that I had let her on and that she was going to call the police and have me arrested for sexually assaulting her and my wife for beating her up. My wife and I simply turned and basically ran back to our car. I forgot all about the fucking knife and quite frankly didn't give a shit about it at that point. My wife, however, said that we were calling the police and reporting her for stealing my quite expensive piece of cutlery. So we did just that, and while we were sitting outside, Sandra came down, still dressed in her lingerie and heels, and started banging on our car door and window. Her forearms were all bloody, and she had the knife in her hand and was pointing it at my wife, who was in the passenger seat. I just hit the gas and took off. The cops met up with us about ten minutes later. When they arrived at the apartment building, I had driven around the block and pulled up in front of the apartment building and immediately got out to talk to one of the cops. I told him everything that had happened, and he went into the building, and another car pulled up, and some more cops went inside. To make a long story short, what they found was my knife, which they later confirmed it was mine due to the mark that I put on it, and also a notebook of poems and pictures of me from our culinary class. The notebook also contained a bunch of original recipes that I had made, and were scribbled down in my own notebook. Apparently, at some point, Sandra had also stolen my notebook and written down all of my recipes. She was charged with theft and eventually was expelled from the college when our professors found out about her actions, but was never criminally charged with anything because she didn't actually do anything to us other than bang on our car door. I finished that class. I have a decent executive chef job now and have never seen or heard from Sandra again. <laughs> I hope I never do. The fact that I had to watch her or arm her own arms with my knife scared the living shit out of me and my wife. I still have that chef knife, but I never use it. I actually don't even store it with my other knives. It has its own home in my shop in a frame. It's a reminder to me about a low point in my life and how much crazier it could have been had I been at that apartment by myself with Sandra. My advice to everyone out there is don't trust anybody, no matter how pretty or talented they are. Be careful and be true to the ones that you love. I know a lot of guys that probably would have gone after Sandra given the position that she had put herself in that night, but my love for my wife did not betray me. To Sandra, wherever you may be, never contact me again and leave me and my family alone.